Hi everyone, I'm Rosalie Janice Gafanshal. I'm the program manager at the Berkeley Food Institute and so grateful to Jesus and Drew and Irene for putting together this amazing conference today. Very excited to be here with everyone in the audience. And Natalie. Hi everybody, my, yeah, as, uh, my name is Natalie. I'm the administrative coordinator for the Berkeley Food Institute. And I'm very excited to be here with you all today. Um, <clears throat> I want to welcome uh, this conversation with just a little preface as to what this the Biomigrations Conference is, right? Um, the Biomigrations, Food Sovereignty, Food Security, and Justice in the Americas is a an idea that I thought of um, almost a, almost six months ago, right? And it's just it started with the idea with Drew and Irene. And talking about what we wanted to make, what type of space would we want to make um, available for grad students and beyond, right? Uh, and essentially, what came out of that was, you know, a lot of email link, because given this uh, current pandemic, um, that's the most the, the online mediums what uh, what we sought out our community. And I'm really excited to <clears throat> uh, sort of share space with everyone that. Um, came out today as a panelist, came out as an attendee. Um, and I really look forward to essentially everything we're going to talk about, everything we'll create. Um, and I think for us to, I think a, a good way for us to begin that discussion is just a simple discussion or a simple inquiry over what is biomigrations, right? Um, it's a term that I came up with, uh, or it's, it's a term that I'm not, I've not yet theorized, right? But it's a term that was inspired by Sintli, which is um, in Nahuatl, the word for maize, the word for corn in English, right? Uh, in, in Spanish, maiz. Um, <clears throat> and in Nahuatl, uh, Sintli refers to a very specific form of the uh, maize farming practice itself, right? It's, it's, it's the end product, it's a seed you save, it's a seed you start off with before you cultivate um, your field, right? Um, and in that, um, through my kind of research with Nawa farmers um, in uh, my parents' uh, hometown in Mexico, I found um, there's certain there's certain knowledge there, right? And my encapsulation of that knowledge is uh, what inspired the kind of the word the word craft here that is biomigrations. And I purposely not fully defined that term, so we can begin kind of a collective discussion as to what uh, maybe the, the philosophical foundations are of that, right? Um, <clears throat> and for me, what I, what I, what I wrote down uh, and want to talk about is this idea of, um, or these three notions that I, that I point out, right? The, the notion of um, movement in life and how that relates to violence, refusal, and indigenous rooting. Uh, and those three things are very, um, I think, important to talk about in our current, um, our current in our current moment, right? But also um, our kind of the current possibilities, the current otherwise the worlds that exist. Um, and I think at the at the very least, it, it, to me, it's biomigrations can be a framework of locating these things, right? What are we refusing? For example, uh, I've used the word, I've used the example of English, right? In our use of English, right? What refuses are possible? Um, what violence occurs right in our use of English, uh, what indigenous rooting can occur through our use of English, right? Um, and what I found this year, my first year here at Berkeley, uh, language is specifically indigenous language. Uh, in my case, now I, like that is um, a way in which we can locate how life has moved across our generations, uh, our ancestors, right? our lands and our, even our spirits, right? I think it's another uh, really crucial part of colonization. Um, and yeah, I kind of wanted to give space for that uh, little preface, right? All that to say, this is not your usual food studies conference. Um, we have people from all over, uh, all over the Americas, from Bolivia to uh, New York City, uh, people here in Berkeley. Um, and yeah, kind of want to, give that preface uh, to just begin this conference. Uh, our, our first panel will begin at 12.15. Um, 
But I guess kind of taking a step back, we also want to introduce who we are, right? Uh, as uh, BFI, we are part of the BFI Graduate Student Council, but also which is linked to the Berkeley Food Institute. And for that, I want to give space to uh, Juve and Irene to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, first I want to introduce the Berkeley Food Institute, which was founded in 2013. And it's a unique interdisciplinary center spanning eight schools on Berkeley's campus. And its main goal is to transform food systems and expand on access to healthy, affordable, sustainable, and equity source food. Um, the Berkeley Food Institute addresses impediments to systemic change in food systems by creating productive connections between members of the scholarly community, farmers and other producers, non-governmental organizations, governments, and civil society. So um, there's a lot of groups uh, coming into Berkeley, uh, the BFI, and there's another uh, opportunity within BFI that we wanted to mention that is the, the food system certificate. So any grad student in Berkeley can apply to it. And it's, um, it's like a really, it, it's a great program. Uh, I'm, uh, I think Dhruv is also part of it. And I actually met Dhruv there and it's kind of this big effort to um, have different schools come into one place from different perspectives. And it's a great opportunity to learn uh, more about how to transform the food system. Um, the Berkeley Food Institute Grad Council is composed of graduate students across um, many different colleges. So if you're interested in belonging to the BFI Grad Council, um, please be in touch. And it's uh, uh, this effort to drive the work and expand our dialogue on food equity. And this is our first conference. So we're really excited to, to just be here and see how it goes. And it's, this specific year we chose to have this dialogue on food equity as and how it relates to black indigenous queer women led agricultural communities so please uh, welcome all and um, if anyone else has another comment please um, chime in we appreciate all of you being here and we're really excited for many of the thoughtful speakers we have both in uh, panel presentations, media presentations, as well as keynote speakers from some outstanding faculty here at Berkeley. Um, echoing some of Irene and Miguel's sentiments, uh, sorry, <laughs> Jesus, uh, echoing some of those sentiments, I uh, want to kind of reinforce how the, like, w in, apologies, I'm all scattered, but I'll bring it back. Uh, echoing some of the previous sentiments, um, we recognize like the, the privilege that we come in as academics in this space. And so uh, through this conference, this first annual conference and moving forward, um, we'd like to take the space to kind of uplift those voices of those that have been uh, historically excluded, um, those from historically excluded communities and make sure that we're understanding all aspects of the food system through our work, um, intersecting food security, equity and justice, through conversations with academics, but as well as that activists, educators, gardeners, vendors, food service workers, and um, uh, the many other essential components in our food system. Uh, we have a diverse array of speakers today, as well as a, a diverse array of attendees. And so um, if you all are interested, drop in the chat uh, where you're coming from or where you're Zooming from today, um, and I'll hand it uh, back off to Jesus to, to round this out before our panel. Thank you, Drew and Irene. <clears throat> um, before, as you're, if you're interested in uh, responding in the chat where you're coming from or joining us from, also tag in, uh, put in the chat as well, what indigenous land you're residing on, right? Um, before we start, officially start, this has all been kind of a pre preface to our presentations, but before we start our official panels, uh, I wanna take space and time to talk about that, right? Uh, and through that, we want to. I want to give a land acknowledgement um, um, before starting this official panel uh, research dissemination process. Um, <clears throat> the Berkeley Food Institute's Graduate Student Council recognizes that the UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Wichita, 
the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Makmikma, Ohlone tribe, and other familiar descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with, the, with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we sit on, but also we recognize the Mokmikwa Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and the broader Bay Area communities today. Um, so with that, we'll kind of uh, take a little bit also just briefly talk about the schedule of today, right? Right now, everyone here is signed on for day one of the conference. We'll have a keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hoover, um, three panels, three research panels, and a really wonderful um, documentary screening uh, by Pilar. Um, and yeah, so to begin, I'll give the floor back to Dhruv, who will introduce our speakers for our first panel. Um, and yeah, we'll take it from there. Thanks, Jesus. Um, so I am thrilled to invite our first panel speakers out for today for our session on um, let me just pull up that tab really quick. Uh, from security to expansion, framing new food categories and experiences. And so as I introduce each of these speakers, I'll invite them onto the stage and I'll have one of my peers spotlight their video so that you get to see their lovely faces. Um, and as I do, I'd like to briefly introduce them um, before they give a brief presentation of their work. Um, as they're presenting or after they finish presenting, uh, feel free to drop questions in the Q&A portion of the Zoom screen. And as moderator, I'll try and bridge these presentations and uh, address the questions that many of you all have brought up. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Helen, and uh, I'm a junior um, student. Um, I'm a third year undergraduate student at UC Berkeley. Um, I am like, I'm interested in studying food systems um, and how to make it more sustainable and accessible. Um, and uh, this, and I still see myself as being in a learning position. Um, this uh, research project, it's uh, part of a class and is still work in progress and is also part of my learning process. Um, so to start with, I wanna just like share a little story of, um, what made me like come up, one of the stories that made me want to do this research project. Um, so last year I was volunteering at the Gale Track Community Farm, which is a um, community farm in um, Albany. Um, and I found it really hard to keep it up because um, I come, I am an international student from Northern China. And there I found like, um, I saw very little that was actually, that actually spoke to my cultural roots. Um, for example, like the crops that were grown were pretty different from what I um, was used to um, growing up. Um, and also like the people and culture are pretty different. Um, yeah, and luckily I was able to actually speak up about this and through the di dialogues and listening. Um, I feel more uh, accepted and ready to like bring what I have that is like, what I have to offer that is unique as well as um, as well and I also became like also more curious like to learn about like the indigenous land and how people were connecting to the land. Um, so yeah, um, and yeah, let's see. So um, here's a brief overview of um, my presentation today. Um, so I'm gonna just um, briefly introduce the um, issue that I'm presenting, which is about like um, focusing on like how uh, the various food movements in the United States are lacking in terms of uh, accessibility and cultural, cultural relevance. Uh, and then I will 
introduce my research question and um, also provide some of uh, the rationales for the key terms. Uh, and finally, I will talk about like my approaches to the interviews um, and some preliminary findings, uh, as well as like my future plans how, on how to proceed with the um, research project. Um, so, um, so my research is about much about um, food movements, and I think it's and it's important for me to um, define what I mean by food movements here. Um, so, like the pictures are examples of food movements that come to mind. So there is this vegan diet movement. Um, there is this organic movement like pesticide uh, fertilizer free. Um, there is um, the food justice movement um, and also the local foods movement. These are just the examples. And ultimately, this is uh, what I'm most concerned about, which is um, food systems. So as shown on this diagram, um, so it has to do with the various processes uh, and experiences on how food is produced, um, um, distributed and consumed. Um, and I am also like including a lot of the exclusively diet movements here, such as the vegan diet, because um, I think there can be overlaps um, that are still important. Um, for example, the in the vegan move, the vegan movement, some people who choose to be vegan have um, sustainability considerations by like considering how like resource intensive it is to produce meat and dairy, for example. Um, yeah, however, there, there are um, various limitations with the food movements. And um, the one that I'm especially concerned about is um, just like how it's, um, it lacks um, access, accessibility um, to certain experiences and identities. Uh, and how it can be inadequate in actually um, listening to and addressing the true needs of the community. Um, so I'm uh, including two of the two pieces of the literature that um, that was part of my literature review. Um, so here is an example that is addressed in the article by. You see Santa Cruz professor Julie Guthman. Um, so there is um, this popular rhetoric in local food movements of like getting your hands into the soil, um, basically like finding healing through uh, and like the therapeutic benefits through gardening. Um, but also like an, uh, an important problem with this that Guzman points out that, that I agree with is that some people don't even have access to such um, to land or gardening opportunities. Um, and this kind of rhetoric also um, distracts us from um, the historical oppressive issues regarding the land and labor relationships. Um, for example, in the picture on the right, um, I, I'm using the picture on the right to um, just like uh, remind of um, how like the Native Americans were displaced, displaced from their ancestral lands. Um, and also in, uh, in the th thesis paper by Sirna, um, she talks about um, how like some of the, the local the food, local food security movement in the city of Binnington um, had the problem that was characterized as food gentrification. Um, so for example, like um, there like the shoppers were faced with challenges such as a lack of um, culturally relevant ingredients. And they were struggling to balance between uh, cultural relevance, uh, accessibility, cost, etc. Um, so, for example, on the left, like there, there are many. The left picture shows like there are many varieties of corn. And I personally grew up in northern China and ate uh, 
grew up eating a uh, starchy kind of core. <laughs> While here, like what I see is mostly like the, those sweet core. Um, and I can also can also imagine like how maybe it requires that additional trips and cost to get the food that we're actually culturally more um, um, used to. Um, so with um, issues like those, um, so my the purpose of my research is to draw more attention to the uh, individual and community practices around food. Um, so because I think um, so the food culture, the issues of cultural relevance, for example, they're like closely tied to like the, just um, our everyday share practices. Um, quoting from ethnic study scholar Montavo. Um, so like um, the, a lot of the food movements, like they are, um, they're being, um, they lack accessibility by um, not being attentive and listening to like the everyday, the, the practice, the common practices around food in the community um so and this is yeah this is something i want to address in my paper um and by doing so i hope to um contribute to like the larger structural conversations that around food system uh, and in this conference as well uh and also importantly um i hope like this project also contributes to the culture of um listening uh, compassion and also understanding the complexities um, that we have like in the food systems work. Um, so with that um, here, like, so here's my research question and it actually has two parts. Um, so the first part is how do UC Berkeley undergraduate students engage with food movements? Uh, and the second part is how do food culture and identity come into play? Um, so I'm highlighting like three keywords uh, within these research questions. And I want to explain a little bit more on like how I choose them. Um, so first of all, I use the word engage like in relation to food movements um, because I think like this word better reflects um, uh, our practices as relevant to like the larger food movement and also like as in the, the in the nature of interviewing uh, because interviewing is my main like method of data collection um, interviewees like tend to um, like voice ideas and opinions and uh, perceptions that might not actually correspond to how they actually participate in food movements, which is like, well, we're concerned here in order for them to be effective. So I use engage to try to include like various ways of engaging, including um, ideas. Um, and I use the word uh, UC Berkeley undergraduate students to like both reflect the diversity and also to minimize confounding factors such as lifestyles and education. Um, and finally, like I'm using the word food, food culture um, to reflect, um, uh, like the food culture like can be encompass a lot of things such as traditional diets and social relationships and dynamics around food. Uh, and I also want to recognize that there are many factors that affect our engagement with the food movements that are beyond culture, such as in terms of income, uh, the in economic inequality, and yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I think I was. Um, but yeah, yeah, like you're back. Oh, good. I'm glad. Um, yeah, sorry about that. But yeah, like there are fact. Uh, I also want to like capture those factors and welcome them in the interviews, wherever they're actually interacting with food culture. Um, so my interview is still in progress, um, and I know I probably have only like less than one minute left. So I want to like be real 
be concise. So there are certain key aspects I focus on, especially like how they perceive their food culture and identity and how the interviewees engage with the food movements. And I will try to find the intersections between these. Um, oh, part of the slide is not loading. So I think I just wanted to end here by just um, saying like my, so in the future, like um, I, so I will continue to conduct um, my interviews um, because this is a term paper. And after this, um, I definitely hope to like in my senior year next year to build, build on this as a, like a, a, for my senior thesis. Uh, and also refine my research um, methodology. For example, like I see in the conference, there are met people with many language backgrounds and but my research is more focused on English and English sometimes like when, when they're not our mother tongue, they probably are less effective in capturing our relationship with food. So yeah, that's an example of how I wanna refine the research. And um, thank you all for listening. And sorry about like the logistical difficulties. No worries at all. Thank you for that super thoughtful presentation. Um, Margiana, I'll invite you to present yours. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Margiana, and um, it's really nice to be here at the first BFI grad Council conference, and I just want to say thank you to the organizers. And um, because my own positioning is important to the research that I do, I'm just going to start here for a quick minute. I grew up homeschooled on a working farm until college, and having access to that land and the experiential knowledge that I gained working it has been an incredible privilege that has benefited me both personally and professionally. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that the land that I grew up farming on was that of the Narragansett and Wampanoag peoples. And I say this to point out that systems of oppression and exploitation form the foundation of our current food system and continue into the present. But as I'll discuss today, I don't think they need to be inevitable in the future. A tad more about my background. So I, I farmed during and after college and worked in various food systems nonprofits, primarily with recent immigrant and refugee farmers. and. Again and again in this work, I saw that supporting farmers doesn't just mean teaching things like, you know, soil science and business planning, but it also means trying to address some of the underlying structural issues that farmers face, like insecure land access, which Helen mentioned, and institutional racism. And while I studied biophysical sciences as an undergraduate, I also saw that over and over again, many of the environmental problems that we're facing, like climate change, aren't really about inadequate knowledge. You know, we know climate change is real, we know it's bad and we know what we can do about it. And in action on these, these things like climate change is really much more of a power problem. And I think the agri-food system is a great place to unpack, um, you know, the social, cultural, economic and political dynamics um, that shape these issues. And while my primary research as a PhD candidate at Berkeley focuses on the ways farmers and ranchers are adapting to climate change and the role of local institutions, today I'm going to share a little bit about another project. Um, and this, this project actually emerged out of an interdisciplinary group brought together through the Berkeley Food Institute. And it explores how food and farming actors can respond to global threats like climate change more agilely and swiftly by cultivating adaptive capacity, which is basically the ability to respond to change. And I wanna give a um, quick shout out and thank you to my colleague, Aide Guzman, who made the incredible illustrations that are in the paper and on many of these slides here today. So this past year, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed just how fragile our current food system already is. You know, people lost their jobs and couldn't find food. And at the same time, farmers who rely on these inflexible supply chains to supply their products were forced to dump milk into toxic lagoons, shoot and bury their livestock, leave produce to rot in the fields. And the workers who grow, harvest, and pack our food have contracted COVID in disproportionate numbers. 
And you know, virus outbreaks and overcrowded farm worker housing and meatpacking plants were then made worse by lung damaging smoke from the climate change induced mega fires in places like California this past fall. So these novel shocks like COVID-19 are compounding the impacts of global threats like climate change, biodiversity loss, and food insecurity. And food and farming systems are on the front lines of these interconnected crises, which of course exacerbate the challenges farmers and other food workers already face like falling incomes and rising land prices. And the food system isn't just threatened by these crises, it's a significant cause of them currently. But despite broad scientific agreement that food systems need to transform, much of the research remains agnostic as to the process of how to do this. You know, we hear things, you know, we hear about climate smart agriculture and sustainable intensification, which maybe sound promising, but they say very little about the actual practices and strategies used or the social and ecological consequences on the ground. And you know, just recently, the, the Biden-Harris administration has said it's going to invest in, in carbon farming, but it doesn't specify what that will entail. And with more resources pouring into you know, alternative farming, we need to be clear about the path that we want to tread. Otherwise, I think we'll likely see the same kinds of environmental harms and social inequalities that we have now just reproduced. So what can we do? So here's where the idea of adaptive capacity comes in. Broadly speaking, there are two different ways to build adaptive capacity. Um, food systems can follow what we call simplifying pathways or diversifying pathways. And in this paper, we looked at five case studies of how farming can adjust to challenges. And we found that the process by which farmers and other food actors make changes to tackle things like droughts, labor shortages, land access, et cetera, today shape how they can respond in the future. And I don't have time to detail these cases, so I'm just going to present a few broader, um, broader points. First, I'm going to describe really briefly the simplifying process, which is the pathway our food system has been on for a very long time. And you know, this kind of farming is sometimes called conventional, industrial, or capital intensive agriculture and relies on a narrow range of high yield crop and livestock varieties that in turn depend on non-renewable inputs like synthetic agrochemicals and proprietary seeds. And this agriculture is intertwined with increasingly consolidated markets, both for those inputs and for selling agricultural products. And it's been very good at making some firms a lot of money under relatively stable conditions. And this kind of farming you know, has promised greater control, uniformity, specialization, and of course profit, but these advantages often fit quick, uh, fade quickly or disappear entirely. For example, uniformly planting a pest tolerant crop variety is a great way to build adaptive capacity against a pest outbreak. But by decreasing genetic diversity, this adaptive capacity is narrow and brittle and makes a whole crop vulnerable to a novel shock like a drought. In fact, in 2012, an intense drought reduced Midwest corn yields by 25%. And not only did those farmers suffer financially, but this regional yield loss rippled through synchronized markets, contributing to a more than 50% spike in global corn prices and um, correlated increases in food insecurity. And because this agriculture is simplified, it creates huge social and environmental externalities like you know, greenhouse gas emissions, habitat loss, poor farm worker health, and the costs of simplifying are transferred to farm workers, low income and majority black and brown communities who are disproportionately dispossessed of land and exposed to dangerous work. So in other words, only a few big businesses win while many people lose out. But there is another way to build adaptive capacity. Agroecology, regenerative farming, conservation agriculture, all describe strategies and practices and movements that diversify farming systems. And diversifying processes try to manage biodiversity strategically to increase the magnitude and range of ecosystem services that are flowing to and from agriculture. 
An example is planting cover crops between rows or between plantings, which helps hold soil in place and reduce erosion. You know, if you, if you uh, cut that cover crop and leave it on the field as mulch, it can suppress weed growth and reduce evaporation of moisture. When it decays, it'll add nutrients and carbon to the soil, both increasing the soil's ability to hold moisture and sequestering carbon. And diversifying practices like these can reduce the impacts of droughts and other crises on farmers' livelihoods too. For example, adding multiple crops or livestock can help a farmer avoid having all of their eggs in one basket, so to speak. So diversifying processes we found promote a broader, more nimble and longer term kind of adaptive capacity that can respond to a wide range of known and unknown crises. But diversifying requires place-based knowledge and context-specific innovations. This can't only be ecological. You know, thinking about farm workers, dignifying and fairly compensating farm labor requires not just ecological diversification, but also redistributing decision-making power and resources from owners to frontline workers. And a broad coalition of knowledge holders in a less hierarchical and more democratic labor system can more flexibly recognize and address problems before they magnify and ripple. Diversification must also include then these social factors like diversifying governance arrangements, expanding land access and tenant rights for farmers, fostering mul multiple market channels and enabling open access technologies like seeds and striving for many societal goals simultaneously. Unfortunately, many policy and market barriers have made it very hard for food system actors to diversify. This leaves us relying on the brittle adaptive capacity we get through simplified processes, which does little to prepare farming systems for the unknown and makes them more vulnerable to sudden catastrophic failure with new shocks like we saw with COVID-19. But the pandemic and shifting policy priorities offer an important chance to reset agricultural policies and markets to better nurture diversifying ways to grow adaptive capacity. So ultimately, this paper lays out a new pathway to build adaptive capacity that's not built on old resilience ideas of returning to the past, but instead is an invitation to transform the future. Um, look forward to Q&A. Thanks. Thanks so much, Martiana, and apologies for butchering your name earlier, but uh, I super appreciate uh, each of your individual perspectives uh, uh, on this area. So um, I invite our attendees to submit questions through the Q&A portion of the Zoom chat. Um, in the meanwhile, I'd like to introduce some topics that can bridge uh, the work each of you are doing, and I'd love to hear your perspectives. So um, the name of this panel is Security to Expansion, Reframing Food Categories and Experiences. Um, and something I think each of your presentations touched on um, was something Helen introduced uh, was uh, food gentrification. So ways food gentrification either encourages simplification of agricultural systems, limits access to culturally available food, or um, dominates uh, communities uh, and provides say maybe in healthy access to, to calories. So um, what are ways do you think like moving forward, the food system can do a better job of um, addressing that kind of trend that we're facing? A big question, you don't need the answers, but we'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm happy to just start start off um, very briefly on kind of where I, I kind of left off the, uh, my presentation talking about some of these market or hinting at these market and policy barriers. Um, but, you know, one of the big issues right now with our contemporary sort of hegemonic dominant food system is that the externalities, the negative side effects are socialized. Um, so that means that the public bears the cost and not just the public, but um, certain people in the public, of course, that's not equitably distributed, we know that. Um, and so I think that there are opportunities when we look at each of those externalities, you know, I, I think like one example is that 
Um, people who work in farm labor and food service are some of the poorest paid workers in the food system or in, in our whole economy. You know, those are two jobs that have been historically left out of many labor protections, like many kind of minimum wage laws. And because of that, those people who work in the food system actually rely on public food assistance like SNAP, which used to be called food stamps, at rates 50% greater than people who work in other industries. I mean, that's crazy that the people who work in our food system who feed us can't afford to feed their own families. But when we look at those, those externalities, I think we can then start to see opportunities to address them. Um, you know, it, it there could be public policies, for example, that implement a $15 minimum wage for people who work in the food system. So um, I think that that is one way that I like to think about addressing some of these issues is by looking at the externalities we have now and kind of tracing them back to their um, you know, structural roots. Um, I think that if we conceptualize um, food system as agricultural, agricultural issues, we could reduce the potential things uh, about the food system as a holistic term. Because if we reduce only this kind of food system like agricultural issues, we could have these uh, problems that uh, Mariana described and the identification that you described to drug. Because in some moments it's like, what is food system? When we can reduce only the agricultural part of the food because as my work <laughs> try to describe, it's like the food system could describe how you perceive the body too. For example, in uh, the actual or currently food system that we have, in some moments, a lot of people promote the healthy food or fit food. And that's mean that you need to have a specific body types to eat that kind of food, right? So that is like my problem when you say food system and gentrification, because it's like, I know if we only see that, through agriculture and land issues, we could reduce the food system concept. And we need to promote and expand that concept to understand other things like mm, the Maya population that I work, right? Or the feed population or the, I don't know, uh, overwhelming population or diabetes population to understand the food system. Because if we only see the agriculture, we only see this kind of focus. And we need to expand what does mean food system beyond this concept to understand not only the gentrification, but the holistic uh, concept of that. Um, yeah, thanks, Mariana and Miguel for sharing your perspectives. Um, I also want to echo those and build upon those. Um, yeah, like um, Mariana, when you were talking about like externalities, like the question that was going on in my mind was like, what is what what are even ex externalities like what do they actually mean like in the li livelihoods of like real people um yeah and um so yeah and i also agree with miguel's point about like um really like expanding like what what how we understand food systems um like for example um farm labor and, and like food service workers um sometimes like they um, they they can be lacking in the conversations of certain certain food movements. For example, like um, like uh, at least with agroecology, like the kind where like we rely on more natural processes to like on um, soil. Um, I do believe that this is a pretty actually this is a potentially very inclusive concept. But at least like in the in the studies that I undertook with that um the these like food service workers were actually not adequately talk about and yeah and that's also much about agriculture while a lot of the places don't even have access to like this kind of like farmland um yeah and also like just tying back to like my research when um yeah like when i was um I, I was trying to include not only like some of the common popular food systems movements like food justice, local foods, organic, but also including some like diet movements because they have, I think they have a lot to do with like how we relate to food that and that and that can affect our food choices and also how we perceive other food movements. 
I personally had an eating disorder. Um, and yeah, like when I was disproportionately focusing on calories, I was really blinded when I, and not caring about like, oh, what are the impact on the environment uh, and people like of the production is. So um, yes, I, I also wanna, I agree we should be expanding like these concepts and expanding like the people that we reach. Yeah, and so that leads me um, to some thoughts in our Q&A chat. Uh, how does your work intertwine with food movements that maybe exist locally or internationally? Um, and what thoughts do you have? Like what, what aspects of those movements are important to you? And then Helen, similar to what you were getting at, um, what about those movements is still missing? So how are we, how can we shape these movements early on so that they're more holistic and representative of say the, the, the culture and um, people that are driving them? Is there anything problematic that um, you found with food movement so far, or um, yeah, I, you might have a thought. yeah, I can approach that question. Yeah, it's like I have problems with that concept too, like food movements, food justice, or social yeah, um, food system, because essentially it's like uh, we reduce like a specific biomedical on agricultural concepts. Uh, because you know, uh, in Latin America, we have 50 million of indigenous population only in Latin America, and that is not a movement. It's like it's a population, a big population, maybe 50 percent of Latin American people. So if we say movement, we could reduce the power of the knowledge of the indigenous people, in, specifically because I focus on indigenous population in Latin America, to say like, like the movement is not like is something that reduced um, the potential of indigenous knowledge, specifically in my work. So beyond food movements, I think we need to recognize the importance and the relevance of the indigenous people about the food and the food issues to shape the nutritional and, and agricultural systems. Um, because um, a lot of people in Latin America could improve uh, this movement <laughs> of food or shape uh, a new kind of food that we need to, a uh, food production that we need right now, right? With uh, all these uh, things that happen right now, like climate change and other things. But it's like, yeah, it, I, I don't know how to define food movements and to, with regards to the food system, because it's like, to me, it's, it's not a movement. We, as indigenous people, we are a population, a big population, 50, 50 million. So reduce the movement is like the indigenous movement. Well, I don't know if we are a movement, we are a people, right? A population to say something, I'm not a movement to do something. Yeah, I can um, also add, add here um, and maybe picking up a little bit on Lorenzo's question, um, you know, about policy changes are often slow. Um, so, so what can be done? Um, and I think that there are some really creative institutional arrangements like agricultural land trusts and farmer cooperatives that can um, that are emerging and have been emerging for a long time um, to address some of these issues. And I, I want to highlight the Federation of Southern Cooperatives because I, I showed a picture um, very briefly, a slide of, of, of their work. Um, and they're based in Georgia. And it's a great example where individual farmers own a stake in farmland and business that's owned communally. And it's modeled after the cooperative um, farming movement that tried to stop the loss of black farm ownership in the late 19th and, and early 20th centuries. And the cooperative tries to increase income and ensure long-term land retention for African-American farmers um, and creative tenure and ownership models can also help farmers implement diversifying practices. And I wanna to touch on Maria's question here about the role of technology in sustainable food systems. 
because one of the barriers, in addition to, of course, access to farmland that many farmers face in implementing these practices, um, is that a lot of the equipment and inputs are really expensive. And so that makes it hard for farmers, for an individual for farmer, for example, who maybe wants to practice no-till farming, you know, they, they don't necessarily, doesn't make sense to buy a seed drill that they use once a year. But if farmers are working collaboratively, for example, in the, in the um, Federation of Southern Cooperatives, they can own a seed drill collectively and everybody can use it and share that, that resource, that specialized machinery, in addition to, of course, knowledge and other resources. Um, so I just wanted to provide that one kind of concrete example. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you both for sharing. Um, I talked a lot last time, so this time I just want to share, I just want to like maybe draw attention, share a story and um, like also provide an example. Um, yeah, like, like Miguel's point about like, it's about like people and not movements really struck me because like one morning I encountered a homeless person and he was asking for money. And I said, I, I have no money. Um, I have a few apples that I picked from my co-op. Like it's just freshly picked this morning and it's fresh, it's nutritious. And he was like, um, that's not food. I want food, I, want, I need money for food. Um, so I didn't handle this situation very well, but I also recognized that I was like, I was like not actually respecting his point because I thought like, oh my God, our food movements, like we talk about like, yeah, buying from local and like having a lot of fruits and vegetables. And like, what are you doing? Um, but ultimately like, it is like people like him that we, the, <laughs> um, that like those of us who work, who do work are, are really like trying to help. And also just uh, wanting to draw attention to like, yeah, I think um, the how UC Berkeley is um, what UC Berkeley is doing with People's Park right now, like um, the place where there there is a community space for a lot of homeless people. I think that's also a good example because like UC Berkeley plans to build on this space, and they say, "Oh, we are like um, we will like um, like set up places to relocate." those people like to better facilities and more resources. Uh, and it's much about like UC Berkeley's plan. And it's also like the, um, um, but this is like pretty much disconnected to like what the community and what those people um, specifically need. Um, and also drawing attention to like, just like the structural, like the power issues because like UC Berkeley is an institution in power, so they're able to like actually amplify their voices and their version of the narrative. So yeah, hope this, these examples provide like contribute to the good points. For sure. Thank you all for those perspectives. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, so I want to do a quick lightning round that kind of spills over from Miguel was introducing in that food movements are exclusive in so many different ways. And if we're forgetting or excluding such large communities, uh, they're not going to be uh, equitable um, as we move forward. So um, maybe in just a, a minute, uh, what are ways that we as individual consumers, um, what ways can we like uplift those voices and uh, make, you know, drive the conversation uh, in a more equitable direction? either through our purchases or through the communities we interact with. Do you have any thoughts or maybe any organizations you work with that you think um, people should be aware of? It's another big question, so. Don't worry. So I think it, but... that, um, yeah, from the indigenous perspective, so we, we as Maya farmers or Maya agriculture or Maya, whatever you want to slash, we are the people that produce 
we are the people that buy and we are the people that consume that food but in some moments uh we only uh we we are only the people that produce and um, sell the food and we never consume that food we consume junk food or cheaper food or super or, yeah fast food that is more cheaper than the quality of food that we produce so in that saying it's like it's interesting that as you say like are we consumers so what what kind of consumers we are because in some moments we when i say we is my agriculture no you're right <laughs> yeah it's like uh we my consumers in some moments we are only my producers and no consumers because we don't have that right so and i think it's something that happened in farmers moments too so yeah that in some moments we only produce and sell the labor year well that is marxist right but we never consume that quality of food so yeah so that is something that maybe replies to you like a consumer who is the consumer and who is the seller thanks for sure. thank you for yeah I, I appreciate that nuance and making sure that even as we talk about these we these topics we reframe how we consider that ourselves um i invite all attendees to uh clap emoji for our amazing panelists and we're super grateful for your time um, i'd like to turn over to veronica now who will be moderating the next panel uh, media presentation on Raspando Coco. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me now. Is it okay? I don't know why my screen shows the name Pilar instead of Veronica, but it's okay. <laughs> um, so, now uh, we want um, we want to introduce you to the film Raspando Coco, which is a documentary that translated to English is Scrapping Coconuts, and it's directed by the Ecuadorian anthropologist Pilar Egues Guevara. And first, I would like to thank the Berkeley Food Institute Graduate Student Council, as well as the co-sponsors for the Biomigrations Conference as this event represents a special opportunity to share this Ecuadorian film with other communities across the American continent. And also a special thanks to Jesus for his support and follow up in the presentation for this event. Uh, uh, me, myself, Veronica, uh, I, uh, I will be the moderator and uh, I am an Ecuadorian scholar and an international consultant specialized in food anthropology and my work currently focuses on food transitions and the intersections between the senses, the morality and power. Uh, thus, I am very happy to introduce my colleague, Dr. Pilar Egues Guevara. So a little about her. Pilar is an Ecuadorian cultural anthropologist, and she's the director and founder of Comidas Que Curan, a collaborative education project that uses film and ethnography to document and teach about food traditions and transformations in Ecuador and Latin America. She is also the director and producer of, Rasp of Rasc Raspando Coco, as I mentioned before. And uh, since its premiere in 2018, this film has received several awards, including nominations and mentions for best documentary, uh, best foreign documentary, and best female director. It has screened internationally in film festivals, universities, and community settings in North America, Latin America, Europe, and Japan. Raspando Coco has a, a duration of 31 minutes and has English subtitles. So we will be playing the film uh, like through this Zoom webinar, but you can also access to the film uh, by a temporary link and passcode that you will find in the chat window. So it will allow you to see the documentary with a better video quality and audio as well, okay? So after the film is finished, we will have a Q&A session. And if you choose to watch Raspando Coco on your own computers, please come back to the session after approximately half hour at around 1.47 Pacific time, okay? And we will spare some time for your answering, uh, to answer your questions 
Das, would you please uh, add your questions in the Q&A window? And we will choose a few of them to answer. Um, so Pilar can answer them at the end. So let's begin with the phone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed the, the film. Now we have about 10 minutes exactly uh, for your Q and a, for a Q and a session. So we will choose some questions from the Q and a window and while participants get a little motivated, I would like to break the ice by asking Pilar the first question. So Pilar, uh, could you tell us about the process of the making of this film and how did you come out with the idea and some what, which challenges did you face on the way? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Veronica. Thank you, everybody. Um, it, it's, it's Pilar. Hi, I, I just had a now a chance to say hello. I hope you enjoyed the film. Uh, so uh, the process for making this film and uh, how I, I came up with the idea. I, I um, In 2012, so that's about uh, nine years ago, I got together with some friends and and we um, we decided we, we really uh, wanna uh, explore our family heritage. Um, I, I was inspired by a book called Nourishing Traditions that uh, looked at recipes from all over the world and it actually broke down all the nutritional benefits uh, of each one of them and I realized why am I looking elsewhere uh, if I have all this you know this treasure in my own family so I decided to embark on this project called Comidas Que Curan to research and document and promote and really preserve the, the knowledge of my family and uh, you know many, many, many men and women, especially older men and women that are the bearers of this traditional knowledge. Uh, about food and medicine and nutrition uh, because they have nourished uh, generation, uh, generations. It's a knowledge that, that has come to be uh, because of all the people that came before and perfected it. So uh, we, we worked on another province close to Esmeraldas, which is the, the location of this film. And we conducted research and then we created some uh, short documentaries with older women cooking traditional recipes. Those are on our YouTube channel, Comidas Que Curan. You can watch them. Um, and, and then my next project was Raspando Coco, which uh, focused on Esmeraldas, which was a province that I uh, had worked in the, you know, my early years as an anthropologist. And, um, in terms of, uh, you know, the process was a long process. I started it in around 2013. And then I went back to the field every year, maybe twice a year, uh, because I didn't have a lot of funding for this film. I, I, I pretty much uh, did it out of my pocket and with volunteer work with family members and uh, friends. And then um, in terms of the challenges, I, I guess that that was a challenge. I, I would have liked to, you know, be able to stay for longer period and, and do all the shoots uh, at once, but I had to go back and forth and then, uh, you know, wait a long time basically until it, it came out. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm grateful I persisted because even after all these years, it's still relevant, so. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting because I think, uh, well, nutrition is always relevant to food and all these debates are emerging and keeping up on the, on the loop of, uh, of the same debates and topics again on, on nutrition and food. So uh, we have one question here and it's, uh, are the re recipes available? And what efforts are being made to preserve and expand coconut cultivation in the region and help farmers to pro and producers? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I, I didn't, uh, I, I'm, I'm getting the cut. Uh, I'm, um, the sound is not great. Okay, so basically the question is if the recipes, the coconut recipes that you were presenting on the film are available and which type of efforts are being 
put to um, to help producers and farmers on the way of producing coconut and consuming, I guess. Uh, yeah, the recipes. I, I just there was there's an article that uh, just came out um, uh, in the Western Price, Price Foundation website. I I'm gonna write my email on the chat box for anybody that wants it, and I'm be, I'm happy to share them. Um, and then in terms of uh, producing coconut, I think that's not the the problem. I think the problem is not whether coconut is produced. I think. Uh, whether you know, I think the major the major obstacle for for coconuts uh, production is the diseases that affect the coconuts, and that's a result of the monoculture, the way that that they're grown. Um, so that's a, a bigger issue that that is affecting coconut growers all over the world. Um, it's not it's not done in an agroecological way, so they are more prone to you know to die from diseases, and then it, this affects the people that make a living out of coconuts. Um, and uh, in, in terms of uh, so, I, I think that the most important uh, problem is you know the 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 the, the fluctuations in demand um, that affect the um, you know the the people that make a living out of this so and and this in turn affects the price of coconuts so that is what the film was trying to to expose uh, the fact that you know the the price of coconuts over time has gone up and this has made them inaccessible for people that have them as part of their food heritage um, and as also as well the people that live you know that make a living uh, out of coconut and for example a lot um, Esmeraldas has several areas where uh, people make um, you know the tourists come especially local tourists and they um, they eat the foods made with coconut so um, the more uh, the more the price goes up and you know the more tourists come to eat their foods it, it keeps going up so this, uh, it really affects, uh, you know, basically the, the tourists can pay for it, but the local people can't. Uh, and then the other problem is that the that the doctors are telling people that coconut is bad for them. So even if people had had the coconuts growing in their backyard, they choose not to eat them because they think it's bad for them. So that's the problem that this film is exposing. Uh, we have room for two more questions, I guess, only two minutes left. But uh, one question related to what you're explaining that the challenges and the struggles of the producers is about the international brands and uh, the international market. So uh, it, um, the question is like, how do people, the producers face this, this competition against other international producers as coconut oil became a fashion? Yeah, uh, well, I can say, uh... Uh, uh, that's a that's a complicated question because this whole uh, fad about coconut oil and uh, it's it's a relatively recent. So when I started this research uh, about eight years ago, uh, there was no coconut oil at the at the supermarkets available um, because it's not part of the culture. Even Esmeraldas, uh, uh, people in Esmeraldas, uh, as you see in the movie they don't have it as part of the culture to use coconut oil. They don't cook with coconut oil. They, they render the coconut oil and they use it in their skin, they use it in the, in the hair, they use it as a medicine, but they don't use to cook with oil because this is not a traditional way. Um, I, overall, just speaking more broadly, uh, cooking with oils, um, frying, spe specifically for, uh, the techniques of frying, for example, is a relatively recent technique. And it came about with the introduction of vegetable oils that are liquid at all temperatures. Um, so it's very easy to pour the oil and fry on it. Frying, uh, on, frying the foods is more convenient, it's faster compared to other cooking methods that are slower, that are, more, that are part of the traditions. So um, uh, to answer your question, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated scene where 
uh, you know, the, this, this kind of products, you know, the kind of products like coconut oil, for example, or coconut milk have been recently introduced into the city markets. It's the urban areas that are, uh, that are demanding this product under the influence of um, ideas that come from the United States. So they're, they're not coming from, from the people that use them traditionally because this is not the way that they use them. As you can see, you know, they, they just, they, they never take the, 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 this, the milk from a jar. They don't even have an industry for that. They don't have an industrialized uh, really uh, system to pr uh, produce these products. They do it by hand. So there's a disconnect there, I, I guess. Yes, uh, thank you, Pilar. And luckily, uh, it's already time to to, to finish. So, um, for if you have more questions for Pilar, or if you want to contact her, would you please uh, write to her email or also visit her website? We will be posting the um, the information in the in the in our window of comments. And um, well, uh, I want to close this session uh, so we can pass the floor to the next panel, which is Cultivating Solidarity. And thank you for your participation and uh, have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you, Veronica and Pilar. So now up next, uh, Leticia will be moderating the next event. And before we begin that, I wanna just take time to offer the transcription, live transcription that's going on through via Otter. Um, and as well, the, uh, the, uh, the full conference schedule can be found in our website, the BFI um, Biomigration's website, which I'm looking as well here. With that being said, please, Leticia, take it away. Thank you, Jesus, and welcome, everyone. Uh, this hour is dedicated to uh, a panel centered around cultivating solidarity, uh, garden worlding across fields. Uh, so I want to first thank you all for being here, um, and I think that just being here is deciding for us to all be um, very present in solidarity. And we have really three great panel panelists here with us, um, Melissa Gordon, uh, Timothy Herrera, and Suri Alwis. And please, uh, Suri, tell me if I'm saying your, wrong, your name incorrectly. You can call me out. Oh, um, it's Sayuri. Sayuri, okay, sorry. I'm always wanting to put a R and everything. Um, no, I, I really hope that everyone can engage with these panelists um, as a scientist myself, someone who really is passionate about making sure that all the work that we do is translatable to the people we serve, which is our community. Um, and so it's really hard to be in this space. And so anything that you can do to make them feel comfortable, please do that by just acknowledging the greatness with a great nod, a thumbs up, um, sharing really great comments in the comments section. And I'll be moderating the questions after they give their presentation. So go on ahead, if something pops in your mind in the chat box, go and put it in and I'll try to keep tabs on that. But first I'd like to introduce the panelists and then the order that I introduce you all will be the order that you present in. Uh, so the first panelist is Melissa Gordon. Uh, she's in her last semester of a dual master's program at Tufts University, studying urban planning and food and agricultural policy. Uh, she studied geography in, in her undergrad, uh, but her interests are centered around land and food justice in the United States policy and spatial analysis. Uh, our, another, our other panelist is Timothy Herrera, and he's a fifth year doctoral candidate. Uh, thank you for waving, Tim. Um, in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Oregon uh, within food studies specialization. Um, and he's centered around environmental justice and food justice, uh, particularly among Latino, Indigenous, and immigrant communities. A really great topic that I can't wait to hear about more. Um, and then Suryuri is a third year undergraduate student majoring in environmental science at UCSC and is also a Global Food Initiative Fellow uh, who's currently working on a project involving increasing the representation of the Latinx community um, in agricultural spaces in Salinas and Santa Cruz area. So thank you all for being here. We're really excited to hear about your work. Speak with passion so we can give you back that passion. And anything that you want to kind of call us um, in terms of engagement, uh, please call on us to do that. Again, we are a community together. You're doing the work, but we're here to support you in that work. So first up again is Melissa, then Timothy, and then Suyuri.
Okay, great. Thank you, Leticia. Um, so my name is Melissa Gordon. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I will be presenting my research today about um, BIPOC farmers and farmland ownership in Massachusetts. BIPOC stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. And I want to share that I identify as a white city-based researcher and throughout this project, I was thoughtful about that positionality and it influenced the methods that I chose. And I, um, I continue to be open to feedback about that. So in my talk today, I will start broadly um, with the US and then narrow to Massachusetts, tell two types of stories, numbers and then farmers, and then share my conclusions. Um, and a few notes about language. So the language that I use will reflect um, individual farmer preferences, but there are also some imperfect terms and groupings like non-white um, that are used in order to reflect how data are recorded and what the data report to, to reflect that accurately. Also, I was initially interested in land ownership and black farmers in Massachusetts, but because of data availability and the various stories and farmers in the States, I expanded to look at farmers, or producers, that's the USDA word, um, producers, um, and all BIPOC farmers. But you will see some instances where I do focus more narrowly on black farmers or land ownership. And finally, the photographs you'll see are my own from visits to the farm. So I came to grad school to study food justice, wanting to work toward building a more equitable and racially just food system and I think this begins with production and at the foundation is land justice and access to land ownership. So for some history about that, in the US in 1920, 14% of farm owners were black and they owned 15 million acres of farmland. And since 1920, black farmers have lost their land at about twice the rate of white farm owners. Uh, resulting in ownership today of only one to 2% of US farmland. And today we're seeing more and more about this in the news and in the media and in federal policy um, that black farmland loss and discrimination is being exposed and um, working toward addressing it, um, particularly at the federal level. So I had been thinking about this topic at the national level um, as an issue mainly affecting the Southeastern US, but then I realized, of course, this is also an important topic in New England and in Massachusetts. And so I wanted to research and learn about it for my thesis here. So I'll take this moment to recognize that I'm speaking to you from stolen Wampanoag, Massachusetts and Pawtucket land. And it wasn't in the scope of this particular project to look into indigenous land ownership or stewardship, but that would be an interesting additional direction. So since I'm here in Massachusetts, I researched here, um, and I have seen state level case studies from across the country and a couple from the Northeast about queer farmers, but not much about BIPOC farmers in Massachusetts. And coalitions of farmers of color have identified the need for more data and the importance of stories. Um, and the farmers and advocates that I spoke with in preliminary conversations were interested to learn more about this too here in Massachusetts. So that's guided my, my research and deciding on this topic. I wanted to make something accessible, um, not just a you know 75 page written thesis. So the end product will be a website that will have um, interactive components and multimedia aspects. Um, but today I'll just be showing static images from it. Um, but ultimately there will be something more accessible and comprehensible. Um, so, to begin with the numbers story, as I was beginning with this research, speaking with advocates and people in government and farmers, people would ask me, are there any black farm owners in Massachusetts? And so we can see here, the data that are available show that at the state level, there are 23 farms owned by a black principal producer or farmer um, amounting to 518 acres. Um, which is much less than the farms owned by white principal producers. Um, and, but there are challenges with the data. So county level is the smallest scale that's available and for ownership just at the state level. Um, and like I've mentioned, um, there's been language challenges. So definitions about farm versus farmer, racial categories, inconsistencies over time. 
Um, and so, and um, coalitions of farmers of color have identified that better data would help with the situation and help develop solutions and help identify what is the situ what what is the environment right now. So I'm trying to make um, and my hope is for that my research will compile the quantitative data that there are about Massachusetts, the quantitative data, and expose the gaps. So to begin with, we can look in a more detailed way at the county level rather than the whole state. So on the left, we see the racial demographics of producers by county, and on the right, the racial demographics overall in the county. So we can see that some counties um, in some counties, the percent of farmers of color mirrors the, relatively the overall county demographics, like in Suffolk and Worcester uh, with a red arrow. But in most of the other counties, the producer racial demographics do not mirror the overall county demographics, like with this orange arrow pointing out Essex County as one example. Then I looked over time about how farmland access has evolved. And this is not ownership, it's the number of farms with a non-white farmer or principal producer as a proxy for owner, and the gaps indicate missing data. So we don't see a clear dramatic decline since 1920 as reported as the national trend. Um, but one thing we do see is a big spike in Plymouth and Barnstable counties around 1940. Um, and my hypothesis for why that is, as I learned through my interviews, um, is a big influx of Cape Verdean cranberry farmers at that time. Um, and another thing we can see is that since about year 2000 or 2002, the Ag Census um, increases in certain counties, especially urban areas, and notably Worcester County is that big jump at the end, um, which has the most farms in the state overall and also a big city. So that's an area for future research, um, but the hypotheses are increasing interest in urban agriculture and also an organization called World Farmers is there and they are a refugee program and farm incubator that helps many BIPOC farmers start farms and find land. Next, since numbers are not the whole story, I also interviewed some farmers. Um, since I wasn't going to interview a representative sample, the point was never to make generalizable conclusions. Rather, it's to tell each farmer's land story. And in order to keep the stories and information in their own words and help preserve autonomy over the stories, I turned the interviews into monologues and each farmer has recorded themselves reading it. So I will now share with you some short clips from those recordings. Um, and the first one's kind of quiet, so you might wanna turn your volume up. Hi, my name is Carmen. I'm open to all pronouns. I view myself as a Black queer earth worker. I'm really drawn to this calling of being with land. I feel like it definitely helped me stay connected to my ancestors. Land ownership by certain people in certain areas is just the way land is passed on to their kids and their kids pass it on to their kids and you never have the opportunity to build any kind of wealth for yourself. A lot of people couldn't understand how I got this from because it should have went through the good old boy network. Big problem for us as a Muslim community. We do not do interest. I got offered to get a loan several times from USDA, but I refused for that. I'm a third generation grower. I've been on this farm full time since 1981. Most of the property that I am now farming was owned by my family. <clears throat> we, we grew up basically around cranberry bogs as kids. Um, the first generation of immigrants initiated most of the land ownership that took place in this region. So um, those are some stories from, from the farmers that I interviewed. And I wasn't trying to find patterns, like I said, or make generalized conclusions. The conclusion are the land stories. Um, but I will share a couple other examples of things that the farmers said um, that were challenges that they experienced that are the same as things we've heard from across the nation or as each other. Um, so one is that the systems are made by and for the dominant white community and don't work well for farmers of color, especially when being considered for grants. So there are things that are prohibitive in qualifying for grants and funding and programs like 
um, requirements around the definition of a farm, around the years you have to be in business, around already owning land, not having debt. Um, there are barriers in the systems of how land is passed on between farmers and farmers of color are left out. Um, and there was mention of standing out or feeling uncomfortable in rural farming communities and that representation matters. So those are some of the experiences of BIPOC farmers here in Massachusetts. To conclude, um, I don't have a sharp conclusion of something that I'm proving, but it's more that this serves as a case study or overview of BIPOC farmland access in Massachusetts. We know that there is interest in this topic and learning more from the farmers themselves who I spoke to, <clears throat> as well as advocates and people in the government to learn more and work toward a more equitable agricultural system in Massachusetts. One example of this is the recently introduced bill in the Massachusetts legislature, this act promoting equity in agriculture. Hopefully the commission that is created by this bill will include BIPOC farmers on the um, committee. And I hope that this research can contribute toward building the body of information from which chain can be, change can be made by compiling the data that are available to point toward the next research directions and to where data are missing and where better data collection is needed. And also because numbers aren't the whole story to help share some stories from farmers in the state and help broaden the understanding of BIPOC farmer experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, that was really great. Um, friendly reminder to everyone to feel free to ask your questions um, in real time and I'll keep an eye on them. Yeah. So thank you to all the researchers and participants lis listening. Keep up all the hard work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Uh, that was really great. Um, I have a, a question that I'm already brewing in my mind uh, for the entire group. So it's going to be a general question. Don't worry, it won't be too particular. Uh, but now we're going to introduce our, our last uh, panelist. Um, and so we have a new addition into the panelist uh, combo here. Is it Aisha? It is? Wonderful. Um, I get it right sometimes, sorry y'all. Uh, and, and so Yuri, uh, Aisha, I, I don't know much about you. So if you wanna just say one little quick thing since I wasn't able to introduce you earlier, I would really appreciate it. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fourth year doctoral student at the uh, in the Environmental Studies Department at UC Santa Cruz. And Sayuri and I have been working together for, um, I guess, a little over a year now. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, so it is uh, now up to you to step on stage whenever you're ready. Um, and again, please everyone post your questions. Otherwise, they're going to get a really um, general question that might be hard for me. <laughs> Let's engage with them. It's a lot of hard work that they're um, putting towards this. So thank you. Thanks, Leticia. OK, I'm going to share my screen. And... Great, OK. Uh, so Sayuri and I are, have a presentation for you called Solidarity in the Food System, Insights Among South Asian and Mexican Immigrants. And we'll be presenting some of our work um, here in California's Central Coast. So for those of us living and working in California's agricultural industry, we know that land access is a major barrier facing small farmers. Um, and we know from Melissa's presentation that this is an issue all across the US and especially for BIPOC farmers. According to the USDA's 2020 Census of Agriculture, irrigated cropland in California costs an average of about $500 an acre, which is 2.3 times the national average. In Monterey County, uh, the main area where we work, irrigated cropland costs an average of $2,220 an acre, which is over 10 times the national average. As a result, I was surprised and excited to receive a phone call from my auntie, Sheena, in the summer of 2019, when she told me about her idea to purchase 20 acres of agricultural land in California's Central Coast. It was a financial decision as she and her husband um, hoped that purchasing agricultural land would be a stable investment. Still, they knew nothing about how to manage a farm and needed help maintaining this productive agricultural land. 
Given my own background working in and studying agriculture, she has suggested that I help manage the farm. And this is a photo of the farm with some fennel growing. Sheena, this is a picture of Sheena, lives in the Bay Area's Silicon Valley, where she arrived in the 80s to work in the tech industry. She and my mom are both Punjabi immigrants and met in India while attending a small engineering college. As two of the few women in a college dominated by men, they developed a close bond, which they have maintained despite immigrating to different parts of the US. When I arrived in California for graduate school, Sheena was quick to invite me into her family and into her plans for transforming her yard into a highly productive garden. We have since bonded over our passion for growing food and her suggestion that I manage a farm business on her land was a natural extension of that mutual interest. Despite my excitement about growing food, I had to laugh at the possibility of managing a farm on her property. At the time I was developing my dissertation research project which was proving to be an enormous time commitment as it involved regular field work with small scale farmers um, like Mariana who's shown here with, with farmers like Mariana, who's shown here. Um, and uh, the small scale organic farmers are based predominantly in Salinas, California. However, given that these farmers live and work in a region that is home to some of the most expensive cropland in the country, access to Sheena's farmland became a major asset that I was able to offer to my farmer collaborators. Many of the farmers that I work with are immigrants from Mexico who often struggle to access the land due to marginalization along axes of language, education, citizenship status, and access to financial capital. I connected Sheena with some of these farmers, and in the months that followed, a small group of Mexican immigrant farmers banded together to rent Sheena's 20-acre property and develop their small farm businesses. Furthermore, Sheena has continued to work closely with these farmers to develop produce distribution project, which Sayuri and I will discuss in, in a little more depth shortly. Despite the obvious class difference between landowner and renters, we were intrigued by this unlikely collaboration between South Asian and Mexican immigrants. In my experience working in the Central Coast, California's Central Coast agricultural industry, landowners renting farmland are typically white, sometimes Mexican American, and rarely of a different race or ethnicity. Engagements between Sheena and these farmers quickly indicated an example of what Robert Yin calls a, um, a quote, revelatory case study end quote, which is a type of case study that exists when a researcher has an opportunity to observe and analyze a phenomenon previously inaccessible to social science research. In examining this, this case of engagement between South Asian and Mexican immigrants in the regional food system, we are less interested in statistical generalization and more interested in analytic generalization and what this case can tell us about potential collaboration and solidarity between immigrant groups that are differentially racialized in the US. That is, we do not claim nor investigate the statistical significance of this case. Rather, we use ethnographic methods to highlight how collaboration across difference does and can take place in this particular geographic context. Our interest in this case stems from our own experiences as South Asian descended people living and working in the Central Coast, and of course from Aisha's familial relationship with Sheena. Aisha's mom is a Punjabi immigrant who studied electrical engineering in India in order to come to the US. She met her husband, a white man, while working in computer engineering after immigrating. My parents both immigrated to the United States from Sri Lanka, where they studied general engineering. My mom earned a master's in electrical engineering in Texas, while my dad got his master's in computer science in New Jersey. Um, yeah, they're both shown here in this slide. Um, and they both continue to be employed in their respective fields in Sacramento County, California. As a result, we both have personal knowledge about the experiences of South Asian descended people in the US and particularly of their participation in and accumulation of wealth through the tech industry. We are naturally interested in and concerned with how these experiences shape possible expressions of solidarity between South Asians and other groups that are differentially racialized within the US. And we bring this interest to our work at Sheena's farm property. In the summer of 2020, once the farmers had established their farms, Sheena invited us and several other South Asian friends from the Bay Area to visit the property and learn about her efforts to collaborate with the farmers. We gathered at the property in a group of about 15 South Asian people 
mostly women, most of whom either work in or have parents who work in the tech industry and are unfamiliar with farming practices. There we were introduced to Maria Anna and her two daughters. Maria Anna is a farmer managing five acres who is also an immigrant from Mexico. She speaks very little English. Her primary language is Spanish, so she was accompanied by a translator in order to address our group and teach us about her farming practices. Throughout the day, we were struck by the ways in which it matters that Sheena is a South Asian landlord and collaborator. Before discussing the field crops, Maria Anna introduced herself by way of her immigration story, sharing her process of coming to California, working in the fields, picking strawberries, and eventually going to school to learn how to start her own farm business. After she spoke, and over the course of the next few hours, Sheena and other people in our group related their own experiences of immigration to Maria Anna's story, yet referenced their work in the tech industry rather than the agricultural industry. In this way, we learned that the shared process of immigration is a major reason that Sheena and the other visitors are interested in supporting Maria Anna's work. We also learned that the specific mode of supporting Maria Anna's work has moved far beyond renting land to her, and that, and that this support engages specifically with South Asians and with South Asian-ness. Together, Maria Anna and Sheena explained their efforts to develop a produce distribution project that would distribute Maria Anna's produce directly to consumers throughout the Silicon Valley. Many of the consumers are South Asian people living in Silicon Valley who learned about the project through word of mouth and who can afford fresh organic produce because of their high earning jobs in the tech industry. Appropriately, the project is called Terra Farm, where Terra is used in reference to the Hindi word for your, to mean your farm. It also, of course, references the Latin word terra, meaning land, which is related to the Spanish word for land, tierra. In the following weeks, when we began volunteering with Maria Anna to pack produce for distribution, we noticed how the South Asian consumers would request specific vegetables that are particularly common in South Asian cooking, including loki, a type of squash, and large amounts of onions and cabbage. In this way, the South Asian consumer base influences the material practices associated with this food distribution project. This is a photo of Maria Anna's biography on the Terra Farm website where she stands holding her strawberries. This next slide shows the three women in charge of produce distribution, Tanya, Sheena, and Marcena. And um, in this next slide, you can see that Aisha and I both had a great time helping with produce distribution for Maria Anna. And as you can see, we packed many boxes full of veggies. On the one hand, we find that South Asian influence matters. It really matters in the context of this project. Shared experiences of immigration and of racial otherness create a willingness to support Mariana and other Mexican farmers at the property. Still, we see a major class division running through this work that highlights the juxtaposition between Mexican farmers slash renters and South Asian consumers slash landowners. Thinking with food justice scholarship that aims to advance racial justice in the food system, we are curious about the possibilities and limitations of this collaboration. How do divergent immigration pathways and differential racialization function to create racial hierarchies in the food system? And how do we fight these hierarchies to create more equitable systems of food production and distribution? We continue to explore these questions in our research and we welcome all of your insights about the potential for solidarity. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, that was also really, really great. Um, I have a, some fun follow up questions, but I'm going to open it up for everyone else to provide their questions in the chat box. Um, in the meanwhile, I'm going to pose that kind of broad question that I had told you I would, I would think about. Um, and that is that my background is plant biology. So I study um, viticulture. And uh, therefore that means I have to go into the fields often. And I have the luxury of being able to go through the beautiful vineyards here in central California. And I've also had a luxury of visiting vineyards in France. And I've, I've had a lot of interaction with a lot of not only the growers and producers, but the, the folks really on the ground uh, doing the breeding, the cutting of a lot of the grapes um, and the vines that they work with. And oftentimes I've actually seen a, a difference and I can't make any conclusions on them 
but I do have a, a possible solution. And that is that when I visit with vineyards here in California, um, a lot of the Mexican workers and farmers there, when I ask them, why are you doing this one thing to the grapevine? Because it's actually really bad from a scientific point of view. Um, they say, well, we don't know. The, the owners told us to do this. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's a response. Now, when I was in France and I asked those people the same question, they said, well, we do this because this is part of our French culture and this is the way we cultivate these grapes to have a sweeter taste, et cetera. And so what I saw was there was a different value placed, right? Into how these farmers exist in these spaces. Whereas the owners would sit down and have a glass of wine with the workers and enjoy dinner. And, you know, it was wonderful and beautiful. Here, there's a complete segregation and I'm sure a lot of your experiences speak to them. So, can we think about together, what is a creative way of promoting a policy, right? Promoting a framework in which we can place more value into the work that farmers are actually doing. So that's the general question because each one of your projects somehow aligns potentially to a policy that we can put forward, right? And so I'll let you guys uh, sit and think about that while I start asking uh, maybe each one of you some more questions, if that's okay. Um, I'll actually start with you, Melissa. Uh, you talked a lot about the language that your project um, was had a difficulty in using because there's a lot of limitation around that. Um, in my world, when you're in an argument, uh, the first thing you want to point out to you is, well, what do you mean by this word? because that's the first point of contention, right? Um, so my curiosity is really more in your opinion. And then also if it's actually supported through some of the research that you've done is, do you believe that some of that kind of um, tension around language and un not understanding and agreeing on language is, is rooted in BIPOC racism or bias? Do you think it's, it's intentionally there to limit? Well, I think that a lot of it has to do with um, the sort of similar general complaints or criticisms of having to put oneself into a racial category in the census, like in any census, in this case, the agricultural census. And I would, I'm sure that like many systems, I'm not sure because I haven't studied it, but I guess um, the census is probably developed by white folks. <laughs> Um, who are thinking in their frameworks of like what types of language and categories make sense to them. And I think that part of the challenge is that over the years, like attempts have been made to improve it, but then that leads to inconsistencies over the years. Um, and I don't know how much about the language uh, being challenging is like, was done in an intentional racist way. Um, but certainly that's part of the outcome it, it, when it's so hard to even get an understanding of what is the context or develop targeted um, solutions when there aren't language, when there isn't language available that reflects the, um, the population. Thank you. So the, in your opinion, when you're in these spaces and you're looking at some of these questions, and of course, like we can't come to certain conclusions without the data, um, but how is the community in terms of talking about maybe having certain uh, racial dimensions to the issue, certain kind of um, limitations around the language because of this? Um, we can allude to that, but we can't come to those conclusions, right? But how are the community members who are not BIPOC um, responsive to that? So for example, are they like, oh no, that's that's crud, you know, we have all this and this, this program in place and this program in place, absolutely, they have access to it. Or is it kind of like, no, we recognize that this is a limitation. Is there a sense of solidarity at all? Um, well, I haven't discussed, I, I did talk with a lot of people in this research, but I guess I wasn't discussing explicitly the language, the limitation around the language with everybody. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it was more about the lack of data in general, like the people in the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, like I first asked them, like, what data do you use to look at racial 
context of agriculture in our state and they're like oh well we don't really have much to share with you about that like we don't have much so then we didn't get to the nuance of okay but the numbers that you do have this year they were using this language and that um i guess it depends on who you're speaking with most people that i spoke with certainly just are very are focused on respecting the preferences of the farmers you're speaking with or of the community members that you're speaking with um and so some of the farmers would use like oh are there other minority farmers in the state or are there other BIPOC yeah. or are there other black and so it would just depend yeah. on what they were saying yeah. yeah um and the last thing some people quickly who are maybe less uh knowledgeable already or something are kind of quick to turn it to well what about all beginning and and starting out farmers like what are the needs of all small scale farmers right um and kind of move aside from the racial component and Melissa, that's actually what I'm trying to, to see if that kind of language is out there. And the reason why I bring it out is because whenever we start looking at data that's specific to, to Black, Indigenous, or Brown folks, um, it is exactly that that we get, right? Is that the data is not there because we don't have respect for the language. We don't have respect for the people. Um, and so there's this kind of tendency to just want to bunch everything up. Let's just call everyone BIPOC. It's a blanket statement. I feel comfortable with saying that. Let's just use that. And therefore, everything that we start putting in our survey and in our websites and in our funding applications end up getting into this kind of big ball of BIPOC. Um, and so I was curious as through your own experiences if you kind of had some kind of uh, insight into how people are thinking and using their own language towards this topic. So thank you uh, for sharing that. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, Aisha and Sayuri, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. I am really intrigued um, about how you came into the space of getting land um, and being able to kind of share that experience with other folks and, and then being able to partner with um, some, some of uh, some Mexican immigrants. And so um, as a Mexicana, I was born and raised in Chicago, uh, but my, my father uh, worked on the farm since he was three years old uh, and has, you know, always, we have corn in our backyard. Let me tell you, in Chicago, South Side, we got really large stocks of corn. Um, so there's always been a big value for that for us. And so you're right in, in understanding and recognizing that there are definitely limitations uh, within the, the, the class between, um, between us, right? But I'd like to hear a little bit more about what are the things that bind us together, right? Because those are the things that when we start engaging with other communities of color, um, that we need, we don't know, and we don't know how to start those conversations. And what are the points of love and compassion and, and food connection um, that you were able to experience? Maybe I'll start and then you can add, Sayuri. Um, yeah, I think like it was just like a really hilarious. This is just so hilarious for us because we were like we were like out in the field with all of these South Asian people who are like who like work in tech and like both of our families like our parents all work in the tech industry and we were like all on this farm and we were like we have never even like been outdoors with this many South Asian people like let alone on a farm, um, yeah. which was really beautiful and and I think like there's there's starting to be so many more conversations about like solidarity between different um, like non-white groups in the US. Absolutely. And we yeah. certainly like haven't heard that much about like um, South Asian and Latinx solidarities, but um, but in the Bay Area, like we should totally be talking about this. And, and I mean, and especially in the food system. Um, and I think like something that we get really excited about is uh is the food connection because like south asians love to cook mexicans love to cook we all like love spicy food so like we always talk about our, our love for spicy food and how like nobody else around us can handle the spice <laughs> really fun well, is don't say that to us because we will challenge you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean we talk about growing chiles together all the time oh, nice. um, which is really nice and how um there's different kinds of yeah, which, which is really nice because it's not this like abstract conversation about solidarity. It's like literally like we're growing the types of um, the types of hot peppers that our ancestors grew in conjunction with like 
all of you who are growing the types of spicy like spices that your ancestors grew and and bringing those together is um that's been a really uh really interesting point of solidarity that i've seen what about you sayuri yeah i think um it's really interesting kind of going off of that like specifically um like my family every time that we eat like out pretty much every time we get Mexican food I think it's like I've just realized like through this conversation that that is just something that we've always done I think just because my parents feel really comfortable like eating um like Mexican food uh as opposed to like I don't know like pasta or something like that um but uh, I was also researching, my dad was talking to me about how in uh, Yuba City, there is this whole like community of um, like Punjabi and um, Mexican, like kind of like a whole fusion of people um, because in the, sorry, let me just, oh, between the late 1800s and 1917, a lot of South Asian men moved to uh, the West Coast, specifically Yuba City and Fresno. And so there were all these uh, men here and then uh, like the United States put these um, restrictions on immigration. So they were kind of stuck here and they started this whole community with um, all of these Mexican women. And uh, they started cooking like together and exchanging recipes. And so there's this whole like culture there um, that I find really, really fascinating. So yeah, I think that there is a lot to look into there in terms of like ways that were similar and things like that. That sounds beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um, so I think we only have a few more minutes. So uh, Timothy, I, I can ask you a quick question. And then we have one more question from Elsa that I'll also kind of speak out to everyone. And so my question to you um, is, this idea of suffering and well-being, um, how do you think through your research those things were being bridged and how do you see that bridge as a solution towards cult cultivating solidarity? Thank you, that's a great question because that's kind of how I kind of even got into conceiving of my project because a lot of the ethnographic accounts that we read document really heavily um, the systemic violence and suffering that uh, my community has suffered, um, other commun marginalized communities here in the US, but there's always this uh, notion of ongoing suffering and even the notion of resilience is about like, how do you overcome all this suffering? But there's not as much of a focus on how people actually conceive of a worldview for themselves, what values, um, do they consider for their well-being that's both cultural and that can't really come out in wellness surveys or other health indicators. Um, but then I also know just talking about well-being could misconstrue the idea and think I'm only trying to talk about happiness and these elated states of joy, but in reality well-being is an everyday process and goes through multiple emotions okay. and how people um, kind of come up, how they construe their well-being is kind of in also adaption to the suffering shared both through the community and also like in their family, um, because not everything is joyous, but yeah, it's a little convoluted, my res response, no, no. but yeah, it's, it's a tough clear. question that I'm grasping with. Thank you. Yeah, I think we all are. Um, and, and hopefully this dialogue will continue beyond this moment. Um, so we only have one minute, um, but if we can briefly answer uh, this question is how can we share, teach and practice empathy? Um, if we can put us in the other's feet, uh, we can uh, feel farmers, owners, uh, owners, consumers, we are the people living on the same planet if natural and healthy food comes from nature, uh, the farmers are responsible to, uh, to give us, keep us healthy. How can we give them value? It's a great question. One thing I could say quickly, I would say um, is kind of break away from an industrial agricultural system and kind of get to know more local uh, farm workers or farmers in the community and kind of once you build a connection with an actual person, um, then you're not creating empathy with an abstract uh, 
caricature of what you think you're trying to support, but you're actually creating connection locally. Absolutely. That's a, that's a really great idea and response. Thank you. Um, so we're going to wrap up this uh, panel session right now. Thank you all so much for your great work and thoughtfulness and your time. Um, if we can give everyone a second to say congrats to you, it's coming in. And I think that now Jesus will take over. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Leticia and everyone for a wonderful panel. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce Rosalie, um, who will be the moderator for our next panel, which begins you know, in a minute or so. Uh, Rosalie is the uh, PhD student in the environmental, in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management. Uh, uh, Rosalie goes by the pronoun she, they, uh, and they are also the program manager for the Berkeley Food Institute. Uh, and a current uh, recent recipient of the uh, prestigious uh, NSF um, graduate research pre-doctoral program, something like that, I believe. it's uh, Congratulations, Rosalie. And um, yeah, take it away. Thanks so much, Jesus. And so grateful to get a chance to be here today. Um, I've been the program manager at the Berkeley Food Institute since we were founded, um, I guess I started in January 2014, and I've been um, a Berkeley staff person since 2008, but now it's just an absolute humble privilege to get to be a fellow graduate student alongside so many amazing scholars like the types we've been hearing today. So if there's anyone else out there that, like me, is doing grad school in an unusual time, um, it's never too late to start your education, and even after um, having other kinds of careers. So I feel very lucky to get to be doing that after being a long life, a lifelong um, support person in my role at the university. So we have next an amazing group of panelists um, under the title good academic parentheses here, unbounded food histories um, towards sovereignty and resistance. And because we have four panelists, um, I know some of the panels have only been three, rather than reading everyone's bios, um, I'm gonna have, um, if someone drew or Jesus, you can drop the link again to the, um, to the, the web page, have folks read bios there so that we can spend more time jumping directly into presentations. But I will say briefly, um, the order that we will go will be Benjamin Fields uh, will present first. Benjamin is a first year PhD student here at UC Berkeley in sociology. And then um, next we will have Bridget um, Gustafan, who's a recent alum um, of UC Berkeley's um, undergraduate program. And then next we will go to um, Nohali Guzman, who is um, a student at University of Texas, Austin from Bolivia. And then finally, um, Luis um, Vidal Jacobo, who is an undergraduate in biochemistry at UC Riverside, will present and then we'll have time for some Q&A. So without further ado, um, Benjamin, look forward to having you start us off. Hi, thank you. Should I just go ahead and share my screen with the- Yes, mic? please do. That would be great if everyone can share their own screen. Okay, um, let me see if I can get this on presentation mode. I'm not sure how to put this in presentation mode, so I will just explain as it goes. So the topic of my talk will be turbulent from, from 1619, the constant changing food situation for African-Americans. Um, and the research overview is the migration portion of this paper is important but it's a part of a broader project to understand the institutionalization of African-American diets over time. Um, how has it changed? And I argue that it's pretty much changed only because of white supremacy. Um, and the goal of this is to figure out what effects, or after defining how the diets changed over time and creating some concrete points in which we can figure, um, understand that, how can we figure out the effects on African-American social and cultural institutions as well as health? Um, so it's important to understand here is that most slaves came from the region of West Africa. Um, and this is important because it's a relatively ubiquitous region in terms of the types of food it eats. Um, it mainly relies on vegetables, starches, and small amounts of meat. Um, 
a very prevailing form of food that they eat is in the form of stew styled things like if anyone knows what a gumbo is or like some types of soups and you usually eat it with the starch. Um, one thing that the first time that the diet of the ancestors of African Americans first changed was during the beginning of the colonial times. And so whenever things first started out, the people who were to be enslaved actually were introduced to a Western diet to kind of adapt them to the situation they would be going through um, once they made the journey. On the boat from West Africa to the United States, they were actually given this nauseating mix of what they call slabber sauce, which is European horse beans mixed with like this weird nasty sauce that wasn't that good. Um, I have a picture here of chili because they say that this particular dish is actually a much better improved dish from that particular history um, that's pervaded in the American food um, cultural history. Um, in the Americas, once they got here, um, they got the worst cuts of meat. They weren't able to buy food because they didn't have any money. And so they were pretty much in a terrible food situation. They weren't allowed to grow things on their own and they were restricted in what they were allowed to do in terms of seeking food. Um, one interesting thing is that within the limited amount of autonomy that they had, they actually worked with um, local Native Americans to figure out the best ways to like process corn, for example, um, and learn which types of weeds or whatever they could eat and that kind of thing. In terms of West African food influence today, you actually see the migration of many different food types, uh, many different foods, like in terms of vegetables or, and then also many different food like preparation methods. Um, so for, to start, African-Americans actually prepared and cooked most of the food in white homes in the South. And so that diet that's pervaded, like that Southern cultural diet, it's very heavily West African influenced. Um, African-Americans also took care of the kids and everything like that. So you see things passed down, like, for example, one of the most common cooking methods in Southern diet is frying. So something like fried catfish, fried chicken, fried salmon croquettes, those all come from a West African food tradition because frying was a West African food cooking method. Um, ways of cooking starches to eat that bring up calorie count like corn, bread, and grits are also from the West, from West Africa or West African influenced. And then some vegetables or like ways to cook vegetables. So okra and black eyed peas are originally from West Africa and collard greens is inspired by the way in which they cook leafy greens in West Africa and they're a very healthy dish. Um, and the last part of understanding African-American diet um, in terms of migration is that back in the early 1900s, in the mid 1900s, there was a great migration. And so once slavery ended and African-Americans found new opportunities in the industrial North and in the West, they actually migrated and they took their diet with them in what we call a soul food diet. Soul food diet is a term that's coined. Um, I use the definition put forth by Adrian Miller um, in one of his earlier books. And it's essentially the idea that people who migrate try to take their diet and recreate it somewhere with them. So they take the essential core elements of their diet to a new place and then they adapt new things that they find as well as keep the old structure of the diet and that's what soul food. And so that's why you can see remnants of like the Southern or soul food. That's why you can see remnants of the Southern diet or the African-American diet all throughout the United States um, in the form of soul food. So you can find these types of establishments in Detroit, Los Angeles, San Francisco, et cetera. And um, that's essentially the end of my talk. I think it's very important to understand that migration is a huge contributor to how the African-American diet has shaped from the moment that Africans first left West Africa all the way up into the current day. And so thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Um, I'm really excited to get to asking some more questions after the other panelists have had a chance to speak. So next, Bridget, I think you are showing a film. So um, you can share your screen now. Thanks so much. Yes, I believe um, Jesus is gonna share it, but to introduce us, um, my name is Bridget Gustafson and I'm here with two um, farmers from the small Northwest Louisiana town of Natchitoches. 
um, and Mr. Kevin Walker and Mr. Elvin Shields, who in this video we're about to see, um, kind of trace the economic instability um, and food insecurity that many Black residents of Natchitoches face um, as a result of slavery and sharecropping here. And they, along with Miss Donna Isaacs, who's another farmer you'll meet in the video, discuss how gardening was an act of resistance employed by their elders, and then also what's being done now to combat the poverty and food insecurity that afflict almost half of Natchitoches residents today. So, Jesus, if you can show our video. Thank you very much. I'm Elvin Shields. I I'm Elvin Shields. I grew up on Oakland Plantation as a kid from 1954 to 1964 as kids of sharecroppers. 400 Black people in this area called Bermuda. Little shacks like this, all the same size, scattered on each side of the river. And after mechanization, they just throw them all down. And uh, move, ask the people to move. Mm -hmm. And people had to get out. They just had to get out and go somewhere. No one cared. Remember, the only thing we had in sharecroppers is labor. We had no mules, no plows, no wagons. We had nothing but labor. And, and, and the labor of your children, that's all you had. So it's not like you had a bargain. You had, the only thing you had was labor. And when they no longer needed your labor, they no longer needed you. And I guess that's the part of it that most people don't understand and don't get. There was no security about anything. Uh, no one owed you anything. And so you were in continued bondage. So out of two, if you were lucky, depends on the crop prices. If you were lucky to get $2,000 for a whole year's of work, 1,000 come right off the top. That goes to him. Now, the mules, the bonds, the wagons, uh, that's about five hundred dollars. You see where we're going here? Out of two thousand dollars, you have five hundred dollars for you and your whole family. And if you didn't raise a garden, you didn't raise any chickens, you didn't raise a few pigs, you didn't do canning, you didn't do a lot of fishing and hunting. If you went to that store. That was credit. And I've seen my folks come back home with $200 out of 2000 That was it. And we were better than most. And, you know, some of these people had been here their entire lives. And their parents had been here their entire lives. As soon as the owners got cotton machines and, you know, and they left. And that was life from beginning to the end. You started out as a sharecropper and died as a sharecropper until mechanization came. And that was life. My name is Kevin Walker from uh, Natchez, Louisiana, but I was born and raised at Natchez. And let me add, that is not Natchez, Mississippi. That's about seven miles down the road. Um, if you lay down, your feet will be in another town. It's a little small place, born and raised there. I came up with my grandmother. I'm a product of grandma's hand. And uh, my grandmother, she loved chickens. She loved animals, uh, but gardening was her passion. Actually, um, I guess I started gardening with her at about seven years old. My grandmother grew greens, a lot of greens. Uh, she was known as the Green Lady. Her uh, name was Samira Randolph. Everybody that didn't know her name called her the Green Lady. Like I said, she only had a third grade uh, education, but she knew so, so much. 
uh, about how to provide food for a family. And even when we talked about picking cotton, uh, there are older friends that will constantly remind me how my grandmother brought uh, a lot of food out to feed even other people in the cotton field who was unable to have sufficient food because there were great uh, uh, food insecurities at that time. I mean, people did the best they could with what they had. And uh, I was, you know, just all time grateful to hear them tell me about how my grandmother just fed people that she taught us how to do. She taught us how to drop a seed, let it germinate, uh, to cultivate it, to, um, to harvest it, process it, and set it on the table. And that's how we ate. Uh, we would not have eaten if it wasn't for a garden around our house. And one of the things that happened in our community that is a little bit rare now is that like we had chickens, um, the next person two or three houses down may have had a hog. The next person uh, on down the lane may have had a, a goat or a cow. When we killed chickens, we shared with them. When they killed hogs, they shared with us. So that means we had a variety of meats there. Uh, we came into town just to get a few things like maybe sugar, flour, you know, stuff like that, to maybe help you understand how we did with collectively with the money. We would pick cotton in the afternoon when we came in and whatever little bit that we made picking cotton, we would actually go and unload the cotton wagon for another 50 cents. So probably all we made was at the tops was maybe a dollar. And we all brought our monies in and we gave it to our grandmother and she put it all in a safe place, whatever, for whatever we need, food, um, for whatever we need, bills, whatever it was. It was very unique to for a person of color to, to own any property at all. A lot of the people there were renting from somebody or or whatever, but we were blessed to be able to have our own property. I am so appreciative now that I learned uh, how to garden. Uh, I have raised tons and tons of stuff. Uh, I have a produce market uh, where I do mostly greens, mainly in her honor. My strongest intention is to keep this going as long as I possibly can. My name is Donna Isaacs. Um, I serve as executive director for Campty Field of Dreams, a nonprofit organization here in Natchitoches, Louisiana. And I own and operate with my partner, Delaterra Permaculture Farm, which is a 14 acre diversified farm. I came here really fulfilling a dream. It was the perfect place that combined historic preservation and green building. And that was my focus on sustainable community development. And so I realized that Natchitoches was a rich resource, not just in cultural heritage, but in buildings and in the history and in agriculture uh, for ways that we can better serve future generations. Along with that rich history, in unbelievable poverty. And so while I was trying to speak to people about improving their built environment, I found that people were struggling just to meet day-to-day -day, um, needs. And the struggle got real when a senior citizen mentioned to me, her husband had passed away five years prior to me meeting her. And she mentioned that her, she only gets $16 worth of food stamps a month. And it just blew my mind. And so the pivot was to local food production. It really reminded me of the way I grew up in Jamaica, uh, coming from a background where we weren't wealthy, but we never had to worry about food. We walked out our backyard, our back door, and we were in a food jungle. We had a bounty of fruits and veggies just growing wild, you know. When I came here, I had to learn to farm, to learn to grow food. And a lot of the ways that were taught to me by seniors in the community where you know this this knowledge lies um, 
were the ways they had learned. The reality of it is that the way the grandparents and great grandparents used to grow their food was more nutrient dense and provided healthier nutrition for people. And so it's really, really easy. And that's what we're trying to do is to share with folks what they can do to start growing again in their backyards and how much better that food, not just tastes, but is for you, for your health and well-being. It's, it's reciprocal. Uh, you know, you give what you can, but it comes back to you tenfold. And that's been the benefit of working in the community and working with families to help them, you know, get back on their feet. Like, can you all see the presentation mode? Okay, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep myself in there somewhere so I can see. Oh, uh, well, um, um, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Vidal Jacobo, and I'm representing my team, my group actually from UC Riverside. Um, a little bit about myself. I am interested in a career in healthcare. So as I am a first generation uh, Mexican student, so I am particularly interested in health disparities, specifically those that put our communities at a disadvantage. Um, and one of the things that I've always uh, read about is that food and nutrition, they always seem to be like at the center, one of the key factors that always affect uh, uh, you know, uh, the quality of life or our lifespans. And it, and it obviously breaks into the uh, academic performance of us as students. So our project specifically is interested in figuring out how food insecurity looks like with indigenous African-American and Hispanic Latinx uh, undergraduate students at UC Riverside. And food insecurity looks looks a little, it's, it's the lack of a consistent access to nutritious food. And these nutritious foods, uh, they consist of you know, uh, the fresh produce like vegetables, uh, specific cuts of meat for our cultures and spices. Uh, these are very important you know, for all of us as students to meet our cultural needs. But when there's a disruption, uh, then, then, it, then we have those effects on academic performance. And so we wanna address those you know, as immediately. And one of the major surveys that was em employed in California was the UC Undergraduate Experience Survey. And what it did was it, it effectively identified food insecurity across all UC campuses. And what it found was that it was most prevalent amongst African-American, Hispanic, Latinx, and the indigenous undergraduate students. And so what we really wanna understand is, well, what are these disadvantages? What, what are the key factors that are making these communities report high rates of food insecurity? And the first thing we want to address is accessibility. And the accessibility to nutritious food is, is, is a combination of many, many factors. The main ones being availability is, is, is the fresh produce, are, are these meats even available to these students anywhere near campus, even on campus? Are they available? Can they reach them? And that leads to the second point, the transportation. Are students able to actually get to these uh, food sources and uh, be able to you know, buy them, bring them back to wherever they're living near campus and, and cook and eat. And the last one being, uh, which I will not get really into, but uh, financial obstacles. What are, what are, are there any financial obstacles that are um, preventing these students from accessing these nutritious foods? So we really wanted to talk about availability first. And in order to do that, we wanted to get a visual uh, representation of of the available food sources near campus. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not uncommon for you to find that there is a very dense population of fast food restaurants near a university campus. So where is the nutritious food? If it's, if it's not even around there, how are students even gonna get to it? So we wanted to visualize it first. And along the way, we also wanted to create a new tool for students. And I will move this over here so you can see. But essentially what this creates, is kind of like a, a Google or, or Apple Maps. And if, if you've used it before, you know that it, it combines many layers of information. You can see streets, you can even see uh, landmarks like bodies of water, 
and grass and even the mountains. And you can see the relative sizes of all the buildings next to each other. So we wanted to combine all this information into one map for students to use. And this, this would also be able to allow students to find specific stores, specific restaurants that, fee, that meet their cultural needs, whether it be, um, are there any, like for example, are there any uh, vegetarian or vegan options around me and what are they? And that's what we wanted to do. So when we collected all this uh, data, we found that, oh, that's there. we found that uh, there was a very dense population of these fast food restaurants. If you uh, look at the key, the red points mean that these are restaurants or fast food uh, joints. And the green ones, which are on all on the outskirts here, they represent supermarkets. So compared to the number of supermarkets uh, uh, around campus, it doesn't compare. There's, there's, there's so many restaurants that do not meet this nutritious food need that the students have. Uh, and you can quickly see that just by uh, having a bird's eye view of the map. And if you move, if you look a little deeper into the map, uh, we added certain filter options here on the side. For example, we have, is fresh produce available here? Are there vegan options? Are there frozen meals? Uh, we wanted to include this to make it a little more interactive, a little more user friendly for students. And, you, uh, and if you click on any given point, you get even more information and a little bit more details about that specific spot. So it was it's very useful in organizing and collecting data. And again, it serves as a tool for these students to meet those cultural needs that they have, whether uh, specifically when it comes to eating. But it does not really identify you know, the disadvantages. This is uh, the availability of nutritious food for, for all students, uh, uh, regardless of, of race or any other demographic that you wanna consider. It doesn't really tell you much more than that. And it, even though it is a great tool, we, we still need to identify, well, why are these high rates specifically being reported by communities of color? And that's what we want to move our project into next. We want to start to consider the right, the reliability of of the current uh, questionnaire instruments, and these instruments come as surveys, as the one I mentioned in the beginning. The UCBS is one of the ones that very it was very powerful. It reported a lot of information on food insecurity and other basic needs, and it was able to determine between low and very low food insecurity. But we need a little more information than that. We want to be able to find what the key factors are. And we think that employing a qualitative uh, form of, of surveys, we can also be able to meet the individual needs of students. And the hope is that when we are able to identify these needs, we can move on into uh, immediate next steps for equitable food access. So right now, we'll, our main focus was determining the availability. And there are many on-campus resources for students. So we want to improve the availability of those we want to be able to make it more accessible to students, which is why we're working on this uh, interactive map. That way students are able to connect uh, all different sources together and create a, a, the best way for them uh, to meet their so, uh, cultural needs. And so what I wanted to really talk about um, on my last point was this focus on uh, validity of questionnaires. We want to ensure that these student, the, these questionnaires are really uh, asking the proper question, so that we're able to connect with uh, with these uh, uh, groups of of students, uh, the, the Hispanic, Latinx, the African American, and Indigenous communities. We want to be able to understand why there's such a huge number of food insecurity here, and if are they are these groups coming in to the university already food insecure, and if so, we want to be able to uh, quantify that. So we can address that as well. Uh, and that uh, pretty much concludes my presentation. I do wanna uh, thank uh, Leticia Mesa for, uh, she's my graduate student mentor for guiding me through this learning experience. Dr. Deborah Pagliaccia for, uh, she's the managing director of CAFE and was a continued support throughout the entire project. And Guadalupe Maldonado who spearheaded the creation of the GIS map. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Luis, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I have a question specifically for you that I can't wait to get to. Um, Nohali, are you ready to go? And did you figure out screen sharing?
I am ready to go. Um, give me a second. I will. All right. Can you guys see the presentation mode? I wonder which screen are you seeing? Are you in the first slide? Yes, okay, I can go ahead then. All right. Um, okay, so, well, hello everyone. First of all, I'm really, really excited to be here and I'm honored to learn from this amazing space. Um, I hope I can offer some contributions today to also think and do food sovereignty uh, from our spaces, right? Like the school, the body at home, the gardens, the market, and also the forest. My presentation today will be a little different than the ones that um, have come to this point. I will present a version, an updated version of a paper written back in 2017 about Bolivia, my home country. And um, that includes some of the thoughts that I think um, are key to understand uh, food sovereignty today. So let's get started. Um, as you can see, I will be talking about land, agreed industry and GMO crops, social popular uh, conflicts in Mother Earth's Bolivia from 2005 to 2019. Um, uh, this paper has at its core the following question, to what extent can the state and grassroots organizations converge in a transformative um, project of the logics of social and territorial dispossession to achieve food security uh, with sovereignty? And to answer this question, I think it's important to look at Bolivia's historical socio-political formation. Um, from its origins, Bolivia's history and the struggles that have marked it were built upon two fundamental pillars, land on one hand and on the other, self-governance. As essential claim components of uh, these popular struggles, these two issues have assumed different names and forms that have characterized Bolivia by rebellion, insurgency, and the non-negotiability of the elements that determine the possibility of a producing and reproducing life. One of the periods that most clearly reflects this spans from 2000 to 2005. Um, for, uh, sorry, um, yes, from 2005. In this period of time, two events, uh, the water war in the 2000 and later in the gas war in 2003, Bolivia's popular and indigenous struggles demonstrate precisely the antagonism between two opposing forces. On one hand is the object, are the objectives promoted by neoliberalism and capitalist expansion for decades, and on the other are the means of production and organization of popular society whose resistances have defeated the power, power domination on repeated occasions. Um, this, uh, here I'm sharing two particular pictures of these forces in the, of these uh, social uh, uprisings and that, that were characterized by mobilizations um, to resist these neoliberal logics um, and that had the leadership primarily of Felipe Quispe on one hand and on the other hand of Evo Morales Taima, who would later be uh, become Bolivia's president. And I think it's important to mention this because it is here that Morales, Evo Morales, in a subversive scenario conditioned by this vindictive struggle genders from below and outside of the state, that uh, he gives rise to his political party move, uh, movement towards socialism, mass in Spanish, and that would later ra uh, raise to um, victory at the electoral victory at the end of 2005. Okay, uh, now some of you must be wondering why am I talking about this, right? Uh, but well, I think it's uh, important because the power of the mass party, as I will show throughout this presentation, has somewhat marked uh, the Bolivia that we know today, especially as it relates to food sovereignty. The rise of the mass party to power from the very beginning was not only supported by grassroots organizations and indigenous peoples, it also was read as a threat for the ruling classes, especially for the landowner ones that had historically had the monopoly of national policy politics and therefore the capacity to tailor these agendas or, or these politics uh, to suit their business agendas. Thus, um, the mass party's victory uh, did not lack conflicts on intentions. The social movement that revolved around uh, disputes of power made the masses' political rights in itself seem to be a problem for the ruling, ruling classes. And this, however, was not necessarily the case. Here we can see in this picture how, um, well, we can see Evo Morales, we can see Alvaro Garcia Linera sitting with one of the uh, historical landowner uh, people that have dispossessed so many indigenous peoples and peasants, right? And we can read here in search of consensus to strengthen this, the productive sector in Santa Cruz, no? Um, but then uh, this is why I've characterized this process as a process of change uh, and ne negotiations and metamorphosis. The so-called process of the cambio or process of change 
was and continues to be fundamentally composed by a series of negotiations and metamorphoses. The social political processes briefly outlined above and their projects for the transformation of Bolivia were paradoxically the context of, it, uh, of these processes fr first fractures. In 2006 and 2007, within the framework of the Asamblea Constituyente, the indigenous and grassroots organizations determined that at the core of their common agenda was the redirection of agrarian reform. This redirection they identified was an essential uh, component to reverse historic agrarian inequities and achieve the elimination of latifundio, that is the accumulation of land in hands of a small minority. Um, in this context, however, the bourgeois, uh, bourgeois uh, agribusiness groups that still had an important presence in parliament um, exerted an important pressure on the Morales administration and ended up nullifying the, po the possibility of the agrarian reform. They conversely st started lobbying to legalize these pre-existing latifundios that allow them to own all the land, right? At this point, um, the process of change that was promised, fought for, and envisioned by grassroots organizations it started to fade away to rather show important contradictions. Um, and I wonder what happens, uh, what happened after this, right? Like what happens if the revolution, the agrarian revolution is no longer part of the political horizon? And I think um, the discontent of the social groups to whom Evo Morales owed his presidency increasingly pointed, pointed towards the loss of legis uh, legitimacy of him as a political leader, but of the political project more broadly. Uh, well, the, the mass political project. At this point, it has started to become evident that Evo Morales was trying to balance things out between the groups in power and social organizations in order to make the country governable. Thus, to compensate the truncated agrarian reform uh, law, um, the agrarian reform law that once promised to give back the material conditions that is land um, needed for the reproduction of indigenous, indigenous peasant and communitarian lives with dignity, the government pro promulgated seven decrees that attempted to address some of these issues. The indigenous and peasant organizations, however, insisted on their demand for a law of the redirection of the agrarian reform, as this would consider their historical demands in gre greater depth. Um, finally, after process of mobilizations, by the end of 2006, um, uh, the law 3545 was approved and with it new challenges were posed. Um, two of the most important ones were the verification of economic and social function of the land, FES, uh, that was a necessary precondition to enact this law. And um, there was a second one that derived from it. Um, through the first regulation, the state paved uh, the way for the reacquisition of non-compliant land, is, uh, that this is uh, land that couldn't prove that was uh, had an economic or social function, right? Um, uh, however, the verification of FES, and this is the second difficulty, um, required uh, the, uh, like executing the process of land titling. Here I'm, I'm showing in this graph um, how this process is played out. In this process, several elements hindering the actual dismantling of the agrarian structure were identified. Among these was the protection of the concessions of land given to the land owning oligarchy within the negotiations framework prior to the approval of this law. These privatized lands, as the data presented here shows, were conserved, conserved almost untouched. Um, most of the land titling took place in communal land, lands of origin uh, and fiscal lands known as communitarian properties, leaving the properties owned by uh, latifundistas and agribusiness groups untouched with no disruption. We can see that here. Um, uh, contrary to what was pointed out in, in, in public discourses about dismantling colonial legacies and its continuation through land ownership, the national elites were very comfortable and pretty uh, prosperous during the Morales administration. And one of the clearest exam, uh, moments in which the alliances, at this point we, we, we could see explicit alliances between the Morales administration and the oligarch and landowner sector surfaced was with the approval of the article, article 399 uh, of the current constitution. This article protects land ownership acquired before the development and regulation of the new constitution in 2009. It stipulates that state properties, whether title or not, enjoy the protection in so far as they demonstrate compliance with the economic and social function of the land. Materially, this was translated into the constitutional legalization of almost all of Bolivia's latifundios and expressed the governmental metamorphosis in its consolidation of power. Soy, um, being an expensive and highly intensive commercial crop, uh, increasingly started occupying land. 
we can see here in this graph how like the, pr the process in which uh, soy has expanded over time. The data on the expansion of the soy frontier over the Amazon rainforest in Santa Cruz make th makes this process visual. Currently, more than 40% of arable land in Bolivia is occupied with soybeans. This arable land is among uh, the richest ones in terms of quality and fertility and could be used to actually grow food needed for Bolivia's people between 2005 and 2019. Furthermore, uh, soy crops have grown 46%, uh, growing uh, um, with a 3.07% uh, of growth every year. And I'm gonna start to wrap it up. Um, as we can see in this graphic, moreover, in the first year of the mass government, 2006, the production of GMO soy represented approximately 20% of the total soybean production in the country. However, but by two, 2012, uh, 2012, uh, soy came to represent 98% of the total soybean production, having reached a milestone exceeding 1 million hectares. Um, look, the products uh, derived from soy, uh, soy are mainly exported to countries in the Latin American region, such as Colombia, Peru, and Brazil. But we have China uh, among the important actors that are gaining relevance in this area. And finally, my, as part of my final thoughts, um, well, I think uh, we can conclude today that Bolivia exports soy and imports food. The prioritization of the uh, prioritization of the latifundista and corporate gates aligned with the interest of the transnational capital on food as a commodity has helped the expansion of soy in detriment of sustainable, responsible, and nutritious ag agriculture for the people, and has also dispossessed uh, in advance and given them so much land that, again, is a material condition for the production of food and of life in general. I think that the Bolivian case with soy is an example of the force of capitalist dynamics and uh, logic of dispossession, even in processes that we considered uh, initially revolutionary. I think that despite uh, popular Bolivian efforts to reverse the struggle of land tenure and agriculture as business and export oriented community, what we are witnessing today are more continuities that rev than rev revolutions and interruptions to the um, structures of, pow of power. Um, Again, I think uh, that the most fertile, uh, currently mo the most fertile and, and healthy land of the country are exploited by local, national, and transnational elites that continue to open frontiers in the Amazon, such as the ones that we have seen recently uh, with the fires that uh, have burned the Amazonian rainforest in three consecutive years. And um, three last points are that um, the abrupt seizure of power of the former Bolivian uh, interim president, Janine Añez, the direct representative, who is a direct representative of the agribusiness sec sector, has uh, brought forth um, even more uh, demands for the agricultural uh, flexibility in uh, the region of Beni. Um, who again, uh, in this project is again uh, representing new threats of dispossession and natural devastation. Uh, another point that I think it's important to understand is that currently the current president Luis Arce has as part of his political agenda the production of biodiesel, which again is, has at its core soy the expansion of soy, which is an agenda that is very convenient to the agribusiness sector. And I think that the, fine, uh, the fires in the Amazon trace con continuities with the Brazilian soy complex, the burning of the forest and the territory of indigenous communities that has um, that has greatly uh, been impoverished and damaged the health of both the people and the forest in general. No? So um, I think I will leave it at that. Thank you so much. Um, if you can turn off your screen share, then hopefully um, all of our fabulous everyone is visible again. Um, wow, we have just heard on such a diverse range of to interrelated topics. I, I pulled out a few um, things that I heard each of you say that I just want to repeat back to start with that. Um, so starting with, um, with Benjamin's presentation, what really struck me is, um, I'm quoting, diets have pretty much changed only because of white supremacy. So that is framing, I think, to each of the subsequent conversations. Um, in the video um, from the team in Louisiana, I'm pulling out the brief thing of food jungle. Um, that is such a vibrant concept that we don't get to hear enough when we get stuck in the tropes of food deserts that we often um, hear here in the US. So I was so appreciating food jungle. Um, Luis offered um, food and nutrition are at the center of quality of life and lifespans. 
um, as a starting point. And similarly, Noheli said um, food sovereignty is in our spaces, in schools, in the body, in homes, in the garden, and in the forest. Um, so I bring back those as kind of starting points um, from each of yours. And this is a question that I'd like to um, ask all the panelists um, who might want to say something. Um, I'd like to bring this back to um, one of the questions that is at the center of today's themes, and that's um, ref refusal as a concept. So each of your presentations addressed how white supremacist ideology and practices have resulted in food violence um, in Black and or Indigenous communities. Um, and you also spoke a lot about resistance the various food sovereignty, security, and food justice efforts. So I want to engage directly with this concept of refusal. Um, how do you see refusal as a specific strategy or daily practice um, of the communities that you brought into the Zoom space today? So if any of you want to take that one on. <laughs> Feel free to unmute yourself and go for it. Okay, great. <laughs> I guess I will go if no one else wants to go. <laughs> um, I feel like uh, refusal is such a key component of uh, what the story that I just told um, this, of these struggles. And I think they all revolve around the refusal, right? And as I have pointed out during my presentation, I think refusal for indigenous peoples in the Amazon, uh, such as the Ayoreo communities that live in areas surrounded by agribusiness and soy crops, um, could be seen in, in the acts of, for example, staying and reclaiming their land with their presence, right? The acts of non-negotiability, um, um, of the material conditions of what makes uh, the reproduction of their life possible um, is, is an act of refusal in itself, I think. And, and I also think that we can see refusal in the rejection, I guess, to the or, or of the sort of normativity of the state, you know, um, of like refusing to put all of the indigenous and popular strat strategies and struggles in the hands of the state. Um, and also to put all their all of their victories in the hands of the state. And I think um, I, I think one last thing that I would add is that I think I see refusal in the very act of saving some seats, for example. Now, when when I see indigenous women uh, from southern Bolivia save uh, these colorful seats of corn that they uh, have uh, and that save them for their next. Um, you know, like their next, I don't know, like for the next time, right? Um, they are refusing to give away their memories. They are refusing to give away their knowledge, their lands, and that of the future generations as well, I think. Thank you. Does um, someone else want to add there? Um, I have a way to think about refusal in the African American diet context. I think that. The United States culture is becoming very informal, and I think the way that the United the African African American community keeps a stronghold of their diet in some respects is through the importance of cultural traditions. For example, like Thanksgiving, Christmas, all types of American holidays used to be taboo, where stores would be open, and now you can easily go buy food on those days. People even go buy dinners or go out to eat in restaurants on Thanksgiving. Whereas the African American community has a strict um, behavior in terms of making sure that on particular holidays and situations we are eating the cultural diet and that's it. Um, you know, if you ask for fast food on Thanksgiving, even if it's in the morning and nobody's made breakfast yet, you're going to get in trouble. So mm -hmm. I think championing the cultural traditions above like the informality of the American culture is um, one way in which um, refusal is used in, their, in the community. Mm. Mm. Louise, um, are, are you wanting to 
and and you'd say okay perfect <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to add on uh, my idea of refusal uh, so I, I like you had mentioned I do believe that uh, food and nutrition are one of the major factors when it comes to quality of life and eating specifically is is a relative experience yeah for each and every culture so I think uh, the way that I see refusal is even though there aren't many uh, available food sources in your campus and I'm going to talk about me specifically just so that I can have a little connection to it. Um, there aren't many that I see that are uh, supermarkets. I grew up around supermarkets that were, uh, you know, Mexican owned, right? And I found my mom would shop there for, you know, the spices, the specific vegetables, the specific uh, meat cuts that, you know, that I grew up with. So I, I don't see them around here, but um, there are many uh, student organizations on campus that, you know, to refuse to let go of their, their cultural connection to their home and to their, to their people. And they they bring uh, uh they bring food sources outside of uh, the two mile radius that I was talking about. Um, there's always uh, cultural events at school that you know that promote the food of that specific culture. And one of the things I can immediately think about is um, when there are uh, Mexican or Chicano um, events, they bring you know the the the, the home foods, the, the the soul foods, if you would call them that. They'll bring you know the uh, there's 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 uh, specific steaks and cuts that I really enjoy. They bring the the dances and the, the music. So it, I see refusal in that way in in food as well. You know, I, mm. like I said, it, it's a cultural experience. We refuse to let that go. Mm. And um, Mr. Shields or um, Mr. Walker or Bridget, do you want to? Um, offer something here and also my next question was actually aimed at at you as a group <laughs> so yes uh i'm kevin walker and um what i can say in that area is that uh all the foods that we raise we look forward to the holiday season um let's say thanksgiving everybody would come to my grandmother's house it was it was called the big house Everybody, I mean, you had cars are probably a mile long, all over the yard, everywhere. And everybody came and the chickens that she raised, uh, she had killed chickens and she had processed them and she had them ready uh, maybe two weeks early. Um, everybody wants mama's cake, you know. Uh, you dig sweet potatoes in September. And of course you got September, October, November is uh, Thanksgiving. And so you had all the sweet potato pies, sweet potato pones, um, anything that could be made out of sweet potato. Um, you, had, you had greens, you had all the greens that you could eat, collard greens, mustard greens, cabbage greens, um, turnips, rutabagas. And I guess what I'm saying is one of the things that I miss now that I probably will never see again is getting together at grandma's house for the holidays, eating all the food that we raised and now the people that came to visit, they had nothing to do with raising it, but it was the sense of pride that we got that we could raise this and share it with the whole family, aunts, uncles, cousins, uh, people you didn't even know. Uh, you could share what you raised. And that has been uh, my topic for a long time. I don't think we'll ever see those days again. And I really miss it. Hmm. And, um, Mr. Walker, it's actually something you said about your grandma in the film that struck me so deeply that I wanted to ask about next. And um, it was around, um, you said that she was called the Greens Lady. And that is a kind of knowledge that comes into that title on her knowledge of growing, her knowledge of feeding, um, that is just involves so much recognition. So here at the university where all of us are thinking about creating food systems knowledge or agricultural knowledge, you know, again, it, it can be pretty abstract, I think, in what we do in the university. So I would really like to hear from you, like what can people in universities do to recognize and uplift and learn from the experiential knowledge that led to such an esteemed title as Grandma Walker, the Greens Lady? Well, actually, um, my last name, Walker, from my father's side, her oh. name is Anaria Randolph. No, no problem at all. Okay. Uh, Grandma Randolph, the Greens Lady. Uh, Anaria Randolph was a real name. Everybody called her Lucy, but the people that did not know her name called her the Green Lady. 
And um, she she raised greens. That was maybe the primary thing. She raised a lot of other things, other foods in the garden. But um, she was known as the green lady because she could drop a seed. Three days later, it was up and running. Uh, it amazed me even as a child. And I all kind of wondered where did she get this kind of knowledge from to provide the food that she did, not only for our family. And, and just for a moment, I'll tell you, um, my grandmother, uh, my mother, that's, that was her mother. Uh, she had one brother and one sister. They had moved away to Houston, Texas for better living. But about every three months, they would come home. And the feed that she fed chickens, we kept those bags. And each one of those came and got a 50-pound bag of food out of that freezer and took back to Houston. So that means they didn't have to go to whatever supermarket they normally, you know, uh, dealt with in Houston. They could eat for probably at least two and a half of those months until they got ready to come back the next three months. And sometimes I stood there and almost cried because we did all the work and they came and got the food and went back to Houston. But that that's just what she did. She took care of, she was the matriarch of the family until the day she died. She took care of everybody, um, half of the community. Even when I talked about working in the cotton fields, she even brought food uh, for those that did not have food in the cotton fields or not enough food in the cotton field. She would lay out a spread. Man, you would think she was on Bonanza or somewhere, you know? I mean, she just lay out a spread. It's like Piccadilly, you just go, go down and get what you wanted for lunchtime. And so one of the things was that uh, she even cooked for, we lived like directly across from the old Natchez school in Natchez, Louisiana. Uh, there were teachers there that got her to cook for their families. They were working all day, they didn't have time or they didn't uh, have the ability to cook that way. But she would have their meals prepared. So they would stop by uh, our house and pick up their food and go home and feed their families. It was no... We may have heard tell of McDonald's, Burger King, and all these other places, but we never went there uh, by no means. Um, uh, my grandmother cooked everything right there at home, and it was from off of the land that we lived on. Wow. So for folks that are in the university thinking that we're <laughs> creating a certain kind of knowledge, like did, I hope that we all just absorb and take that in, in terms of like what that is, in terms of um, real food security in your community, feeding so many people that are teaching in the schools and so many people in the, in the families and wider community. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I had another question, but I wanted to get to this one from the audience from, from Lorenzo Washington. Hi, Lorenzo, nice, nice to see you on here. Um, have we seen another culinary transformation over the last century or so as the communities of folk within the African diaspora from outside the US have grown? So um, perhaps Benjamin, you could answer that one. Um, yeah, I think we have. Um, I didn't get a chance um, to talk about my research in full extent, but I think the contemporary change in the African-American diet is through neoliberalism. And so starting in the 1970s, that's when like the food culture of the entire United States shifted and people started eating highly processed foods, fast foods. You see brands like Oreo on everything, Coca-Cola everywhere. Um, and this is exacerbated even stronger, more stronger in the African-American community because when you're in a food desert, you only have access to fast food. You only have access to these like quick markets where you're gonna go and you're gonna get Coca-Cola, you're gonna get a candy bar. And the amount of money that they're spending on advertising the amount of scientific advancement they have in terms of figuring out how they can shred up crystals of salt and sugar and make them adhesive to different foods, all kinds of different ways, target the palates, I guess. I wouldn't say palates, but target African-American communities in different ways and disproportionately. And so now, as they were, as the elders were talking about in um, Nacogdoches, um, it used to be where when I was, even when I was younger, like the idea of getting McDonald's or Burger King and that kind of thing was like pretty much, I wouldn't say taboo, but like it's not happening maybe once every two or three weeks if we're lucky. But as things shifted and the community shifted, 
um, the work standards like that my mom had to do shifted and all these other different things changed. I found myself increasingly eating that kind of food and even like my elders who, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, I probably would have gotten in trouble for eating McDonald's as much as I do now. But now like we all eat it the same amount because of how things have changed and COVID has even made it worse. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's um, my response to that. And I see that we're wrapping up right um, at 3.59 here and that our esteemed um, keynote speaker, um, Dr. Elizabeth Hoover has joined us. So I want to thank all of our panelists for this inspiring conversation. Um, look forward to continuing this conversation and turn it back to um, Jesus.